In the trial, uh, both jury panels are present in court. Uh, good morning to you all. And we're ready to resume with the direct examination of the defendant, Lyle Menendez. Uh, Ms. Lansing, you may continue. Thank you. And for the record, Mr. Bird is a little late this morning, he had some car trouble, but uh, they'll proceed without him and uh, he should be arriving shortly. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Menendez, when we left off the other day, we were talking about the period of time after your family moved to California, which happened in the summer of 1986. Is that correct? Right. And from the time that your family moved to California until the summer of, until August of 1989, were you regularly in contact with your family? Um, mostly over the phone. And during that period of time, was the contact pretty much the same, or did it change? There was more at one time, less at another? Um, there was less. You mean physical contact? No, telephone contact we're talking about now. It was the same. And how often would you talk to your father every week? Um, two or three times a week. And would these be short telephone conversations or would they be long? Usually pretty long, describing everything that was going on now that day or that week. When you say pretty long, how long do you mean? I mean, mm. is long to you 10 minutes or a half an hour? Or? Like an hour and a half, hour. And you told us earlier about how you, when you were younger, had to report at the dinner table in a very detailed manner about your day. Do you remember telling us that? Yes. And is this the same as these phone conversations with your dad during this period of time, or was it different? It was the same, but uh, a little more detail as to what was going on since he wasn't there. And what type of detail <coughs> would he ask you about? Just um, exactly who I, who I was in contact with, um, more, much more detail about my actual classes, uh, school work than we did when I was in high school, and he pretty much didn't care as much. Um, M more detail as to who I was and whether I was spending my time at Terry's, <coughs> what friends I had around me or not, you know, how much time I was devoting to different things. A little more uh, detail, I think. Did he continue to question you about your tennis game? Yes. And with the same degree of detail that he had before, or? The same, it? yeah. And during this period from 1986 to 1989, how often would you speak to your mother on the phone, on an average? Um, maybe, tw maybe twice a week, not as often. Um, she would call a lot more often, but I wouldn't talk to her. Why not? I would be at my Aunt Terry's most of the days, and she would just call several times a day. Would just call and say? And several times a day she would call, at least seemed like it was several times a day. And would she uh, ask you what was going on in your life in the same way, or, or were your conversations different with her? They were much different, just um, <laughs> reporting something my dad wanted me to know, um, letting me know when my dad was available to talk. Um, and when you say letting you know when your dad was available to talk, you mean scheduling your talks with your father, that type of thing? Or? Yes. During this period of time, 1986 to 1989, did you speak with your brother regularly on the phone? Yes. And was it the same over this period of time, or did it change? I mean, did you always speak to him with the same degree of frequency from 1986 to 1989? Or? Um. I spoke to him a lot in uh, the fall of 86. I spoke to him um, less in the spring of 87. Were you gone in the spring of 87? Yeah, I was traveling. 
I was traveling. Did you still call when you were traveling? Yes. And then, <coughs> upon your return in uh, the summer of 87, and then 88 and 89, did you speak to him on the phone when you weren't living in the same place with him? Yes. And during the fall of 86, you said you spoke to him a lot. Is that correct? Right. Was there any particular reason why you were speaking to him more often then? Yes. Why was that? Because um, my mother was having problems. What kind of problems? Was your brother relating to you the problems your mother was having? Yes. And what was he telling you about what was happening with your mother? State of mind, Your Honor. All right, it's not being received for the truth of what was said, but just to reflect the state of mind of the witness as to um, information he received. He was telling me that uh, he was, basically he was um, constantly, I would say, hysterical times, crying, um, very nervous, continually uh, telling me about my mom's um, <coughs> problems with, sometimes problems with my dad, mostly just her own rages and uh, um, problems with alcohol. Times she was just, he couldn't talk to her. She was just spaced out. Um, he would tell me bizarre things. Uh, one time when he found blood on her sheets in her bedroom, we talked about that and what that could be. Um, her going through his things. Uh, what do you mean, her going through his things? He would just find his bedroom in a, a way that somebody had gone through it. Uh, he, was, he just seemed very uh, concerned. I felt um, extremely bad that I was far away and that I couldn't be there. And uh, Why? Why did you feel badly you were far away and couldn't be there? Because uh, it seemed like he needed me. And uh, we had always been emotionally there <coughs> for each other. And uh, I seemed far away. During this period of time between 1986 and 1989, did you fly back to Los Angeles to see your family often? I did. How often? Uh, in the fall, I flew back several times. I can't, can't really say how many times. And it just changed. I mean, I was there quite a bit in the spring because I was in and out traveling was not there as frequently in the summer of 87. Um, and then once I started school, I used to fly back very often. And would your father fly into New Jersey periodically while you were living there? Uh, he would fly in as often as I would fly out there. He would just be at my Aunt Terry suddenly. Um, he had lots of business in New York and different areas, so he was there. <coughs> You know, I, I expected him any time, continually. And did your mother accompany him sometimes? Sometimes. During the periods of time when you were in, your, in the presence of your mother and father, rather than talking to them on the phone, I think you described that there was a change in their relationship. Is that correct? Yes. And. What changes did you observe? Section Vegas time. During the period from 1986 to 1989, did you observe a pattern of change? A, a different, a if I can go back, Your Honor, let me start again. During the period of 1986 to 1989, did your uh, parents' relationship appear to be very different than it was before that time? Yes. And what were the changes that you saw in their relationship? Pretty dramatic change. Uh, she was, you know, when I said before, with basically them 
seeming more like a couple um, at times uh, holding hands and him being very polite to her but the bigger change was just uh, my dad being very um, uh, how to describe she was she seemed very out of control and as she had throughout my life but here it was it was much more open and uh, she was very uh, sarcastic <coughs> and uh, she would attack him verbally and he would uh, he would just take it and I could I could tell that he was tense I wouldn't say that they were uh, a happy couple I would he seemed very tense and uh, he just continually took it and, and tried to placate her and just... What did, what did you think about that? Did you think he had become just some henpecked husband? Um, that he was tolerating this or he didn't care that she was yelling at him? Or Did you understand what was going on? I felt it was... Uh, because of Louise and uh, because of his, um, he had just chosen to, he needed to keep the marriage together. And that's what I felt. He was going to do whatever it took to keep the marriage together. And my mother seemed to know that. And uh, she basically uh, could do what she wanted. When you were younger, you've testified before that, that there were things that your mother did to you and your brother that you felt wouldn't have happened when your father was around, when you were younger. Right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So did you believe your father could set some limits on your mother's behavior when you were younger? Yes. Did you believe that he could set limits on your mother's behavior from this period, from 1986 to 1989? No. State of mind again, Your Honor. All right, it'll be received only for the witness's state of mind and for no other purpose. And how did that make you feel with regard to your mother and what she could do? It was uh, frightening because uh, I really did rely on my dad to uh, keep her in check to some degree. Um, she just, uh, I mean, seeing her attack him was, in public, was something unbelievable. And, uh, she was extremely, uh, unhappy, suicidal, uh, and, and there was, I was incredibly concerned, I was concerned for my brother who was actually in the house, and uh... Did you ever hear her threaten to, to kill herself? Yes. And when was that? Was it just once, or were there more than one occasion? She was threatening suicide for a long period of time, pretty much all the way through those years. Um, and she would threaten to uh, take everybody with her. How she did was she threaten to take everybody with her? What would she say? She would threaten to poison herself and everybody, meaning, meaning my dad and Eric and myself. When did she make these threats to poison herself and everybody else? In 1987 and then in Beverly Hills. What house were you living in in 1987? In the Calabasas house, the rental house. Do you have specific memories of those conversations in that house? I remember the screaming and the threatening and my dad um, saying that he didn't trust her and to the point of, at times, refusing to eat the food that she had served and How that we actually would leave. How would that happen, that he would refuse to eat the food that was served? He would just suddenly, right before the meal was about to be served, 
tell Eric and I that we were going out to eat. And my mom would, the time I remember there, my mom would be furious. And uh, basically he just said, I don't trust you. And he wouldn't say any more than that. And uh, I would ask my dad why he felt, you know, it was crazy because there, there were days, you know, obviously we ate at the house. But there were just some days when my dad felt he, she might do something based on the way she was acting that day or things they had said. He wouldn't tell me, but that's what I figured. So we would all leave. So how would you know when it was okay to eat the food? We would just rely on my dad. You said that there, you didn't feel that your dad now could set the limits for your mother or control her behavior like she had before. Did that have any effect on how she behaved toward you? Did it change? Did how she behaved toward you change? Yes. In what way? In, in the way that she was much more threatening with, it was usually connected to killing herself also, but um, she was just, uh, she had a much more bigger role in my life, really, than my dad did even. Um, How about feelings that she had toward you? Did she express them differently yeah. during this period of time? Um, I wouldn't say that they were different. She, she just, she expressed the same, uh, hatred, feeling of me being the major problem in her life. Um, but it was, it was more uh, frequent, and it would happen in front of my dad. And Had it, she ever expressed in front of your dad the fact that she hated you or you'd ruined her life? Had she ever said those things in front of your dad before? No. And was she saying them during this period of time? Frequently. And what would he do? He would do nothing. When she's saying these things to you, that she hates you and that you've ruined her life, how did you feel? Uh, I felt just confused. And, uh, this did it hurt? Yeah, it hurt. <coughs> Did you, you told us the other day that when your brother told you that he'd found a suicide letter, you talked to your mother and told her to leave your dad and, and to come live with you. Is that correct? Yes. Why did you do that when she had behaved this way toward you all your life? Because I wanted her to know that I felt like all the things she had done to me and just our bad relationship. I thought she was suicidal and I, I wanted to uh, help her and I wanted her to know that um, it wasn't that I loved my dad more, that, that I loved her and, and my brother loved her. And uh, if she seemed like she wanted to stay in Princeton, that seemed to make her happy and that we would in a divorce, uh, side with her and stay in Princeton. And that, because uh, that seemed to be what was causing her to want to kill herself was the divorce. And I wanted her to know that her family would be with her. Did you write her a letter in July of 1987 when you were in Madrid? Yeah. Your Honor, I'd like to mark this as next in order. 245, I believe. <coughs> the letter, the envelope, and its contents. May I approach you? Okay. Mr. Menendez, I'm showing you the envelope we've marked as 245. I'm asking you to recognize that. Um, it's a letter I sent to my mother. 
And is there a postmark on it? July 14, 1987. And where is it from? Madrid. And inside is a one-page letter with writing on both sides. Do you recognize that letter? Yes. And would you read for us just the first few lines? The first six lines. Um, hi, Mom. How are you? I hope you're all right and hanging in there. I often worry about you. You're the only mother I have and would want. Made any new friends, done anything interesting? I hope so. I'm all right over here. Cole and I traveled. And then it goes on and you talk about your trip. Is that correct? Right. Thanks. And would you get the last paragraph? I hope everything, everything's all right at home with Dad and Eric. I miss you all. I miss you all. I will write very soon again, so check the mailbox. Love you, Mom, Lyle. When you wrote that letter to her, were those true feelings? Yes. Did you love your mom? Yes. Were you worried about her? Yes. Did you continue to try to reach out to her during this period of time? I tried uh, a few times and tried to let her know that we loved her, but uh, she didn't never acknowledge that. You told us the other day about an incident in which she showed you the pills she was taking. Do you remember that? Yes. When did that conversation take place? At my Aunt Terry's in, uh, I'm not exactly sure when. Do you know what year? Can you remember? Um, Nineteen eighty-nine, I believe. But sometime after they moved to California, and you were still living back in New Jersey, is that correct? Right. And when she told you that she was taking these these thirteen pills a day, why did she say she was taking them? She said she was taking them because she needed them to get through the day. What did you think that meant? That she was in having a trouble controlling herself and in a lot of pain, and that these pills were helping. And did she tell you why she was in so much pain? Um, she said that it was my fault because I was stressing my dad out. Did that make you feel good or bad? Um, it made me feel very bad and uh, sorry and wanting to understand her. It was a very uh, strange conversation. And you knew about Louise at that time, didn't you? Yes. Did you ever say to her, Mom, you know you're upset about Louise, it's not my fault? No. Why not? Because it was an unusual conversation, just, um... Unusual in what way? Uh, first time she ever acknowledged that she had a problem to me. And uh, I had known, you know, the severe problems for my whole life. And it's the first time she came to me and showed me, you know, an example of how bad it was. And, uh... but she couldn't uh, acknowledge what the problem was. During this period of time from 1986 to 1989, did it seem like your parents knew a lot about your life? 
I think they knew almost everything about what was going on in my life. And is this partly because of all the telephone conversations and seeing each other so much and you being asked all these questions? Partly, yeah. And is it partly because of something else? Um, yes. Did you later find out that they were doing something that would give them more information about you and your brother? Yes, the phones were tapped, my brother's phones and the house phones. How did you find that out? Afterwards. How did you find it out? Did you hear something? Yes, we, she had, we, I saw the re, tape recorder plugged into the wall and I also listened to some of the tapes of conversations between my brother and I and my brother and his friends, anyone who had called the house. You talked about the fact that during this period of time your your father seemed to have lost control over your mother. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Had he become somebody who was weak and frightened and uh, had no power? No, my dad was never weak. Would your dad talk about his business dealings during this period of time, 1986 to 1989? Yes. And what information did you have about what was happening with the company that he was had taken over? Had he done a good job with it or a bad job? Oh, he was. He'd done a remarkable job. Um, the company was a shambles. He'd come in. He came in and fired a great number of people and cleaned up the company's act and uh, very aggressively took it um, to be a profitable company. And he was making millions of dollars doing this. And they was making everybody money, and it was just getting bigger and bigger. And uh, everybody thought he was he could do no wrong. Was he kind-hearted in his business dealings? Mm -hmm. Would he talk to you about the things he did in business? Yes. And did you have an opportunity to observe how he operated in business from the time you worked at the company? Yes. Was he kind-hearted in his business? No, he was Objection. ruthless. Objection the Would he talk to you about squeezing out smaller businessmen? Yes. Did he talk to you about doing business with people that other people were frightened of? Did he talk to you about the people he did business with? Yes. And what kind of people was he doing business with? Um. <coughs> Well, he did business with uh, people that, some people that other executives were, according to him, too afraid to do business with, and his connections allowed him to do business with, like Morris Levy, who was a guy that owned a chain in, of video stores in Boston area, and he was a, my understanding was he was a gangster. So my dad flew out to meet him at the hotel because he was ordered by the court because he was going to prison to re get rid of his assets, this guy, and nobody was uh, had enough courage to go out and meet with him and discuss a deal. My dad flew out personally. Did your dad seem to be pretty brave in terms of the people that he did business with? Did your dad, how did your dad seem with regard to the people he did business with? He seemed fearless. He talked about doing business with uh, Barry Gordy, other, you know, we, we had, he had conversations about Noel Bloom, and he talked, uh, he basically had confrontations with these people in which he felt that they were afraid of him and, and he was not afraid of them. And these are the stories he would tell you? Yes. Now, in terms of the company, you said that it had been a shambles and then he took it over and it was doing extremely well. Is that correct? Yes. Did he talk to you about um, whether he was taking 
compensation in money or stock or how he was doing that? Um, he was getting a salary, but he chose to take most of his compensation, almost all of it really, in, in stock, the bulk of it, and would continue to do so. And while he was in charge of the business, had the stock gone up in value considerably? Yeah, it went from being essentially not worth anything to it was in the 20s or something. He, he constantly monitored it. Um, and during the time that you were working at the company or hearing him talk about it, who seemed to be the one responsible for the increase in value in the stock? My dad was responsible for everything. Um, everybody worked hard, but uh, he really, he, it was essentially just uh, like a little, it was a company that he used to purchase other companies, to make deals, a uh, platform for his deal making. And uh, Was he going to continue to work there for a period of time? He. He was going to work there a couple more years. Cause and he, what was the expectation with regard to what was going to happen in the next couple of years in terms of money? Like a foundation. So same. Did he talk to you about where the company was going and why he was going to work a couple more years? Yes. And why was he going to work a couple more years? Well, he was really tired of working with the company and in business. But the money just kept getting bigger and bigger, and especially the next contract was going to be real big money, he kept saying. And he just felt like he had to go another couple years until he could get the kind of money he needed so he could do what he really wanted, which was to go into politics and move out of the state. Okay, did he talk to you about going into politics? <coughs> yes. And where was he going to? move. You said he was going to move out of state. Where was he going to move? Florida. And was this just some sort of general dream, someday I'd like to go in politics, or did he seem to have a very specific plan? No, it was very specific. Um, he even had the place that he wanted to buy in mind. The place he wanted to buy for what? To live in or to work in? or To live. What kind of place did he want to buy? Um, it was a little peninsula. Uh, that had like seven other houses on the compound and uh, one for my brother eventually when he got married and so on and one for me, my grandmother, both my Aunt Terry, you know, my, my Aunt Terry's family, Terry and Carlos himself and um, I'm not sure who else he, he was going to have lived there but he was going to have everybody on the compound and he was going to base himself out of there. Now, had he gone looking for real estate? I mean, had he actually found something like Yeah, this that? is what he found, and uh, he discussed it you know, with my grandmother, Terry and Carlos, and uh, that's what he wanted to do. And so he was going to buy this <coughs> compound, and when you got married, you were going to live next door. Right. And your brother was going to live in the house down the street. Or whatever. That's what I guessed, yeah. How did you feel about that? Um, I didn't really feel one way or the other. I kind of uh, was in thinking about school and tennis, and I would just live where my dad lived. And uh, that was, you know, it sounded like a incredible place, and that was fine. Now, when your dad was talking about going into politics, was he also talking about you going into politics? Yes. And in the summer of 1987, did he make a decision about your personal appearance that was based on the idea that you were going to go into politics? Yes. Is this something that's hard for you to talk about? Yes. Can you tell me what the decision is your dad? Well, let me go back. 
Had you started losing some hair earlier in your life? Yes. How old were you when you started noticing that you were losing some hair? I think 14. And did you, did some people tease you about it? Yes. And who is it that teased you about it? Uh, mostly tennis coach. Um, occasionally someone at school would say something about it. I was losing very little hair, but still was disturbing to me. And did you talk to your dad about this? Um, no, not, not back then. You weren't bald at 14 or 15, were you? No. So you were just using, losing a small amount of hair? Yes. And in the summer of 1987, uh, did you and your dad have a conversation about the state of your hair? Yes. And what was that conversation? He felt that uh, he wanted me to go into politics and uh, that I would be going to Princeton in the fall and that's where I would meet a lot of my contacts. And uh, he felt that I was going to, even though it wasn't um, very noticeable at that point, that uh, I would probably continue to lose my hair. And uh, that, he th that it would be a good idea to maybe right now, before I meet these people at Princeton, to get a hairpiece. And did you do that? I did. How old were you? Uh, I, was, I think I was 19. And what did they have to do to give you a hairpiece? They, uh, I had lots of hair, so they shaved my head. Your whole head? Just the area where the hairpiece went on. And what area is that? Um, essentially just around the crown area and all the way back. And did you get a hairpiece then? Yes. And are you wearing it today? Yes. How did you feel about getting a hairpiece at 19? I was uh, very worried. Um, mostly for you know, superficial reasons like dating and stuff. I, mean, I had a girlfriend at the time, and I was glad for that because uh, I was concerned about dating and, um, you know, just jokes, people finding out. Uh, but my dad was pretty insistent that it was the right thing to do. So um, I did it. Did you tell your brother? <coughs> no. But uh, I think he knew I had something done. Something done like what? I, I don't know. He, some kind of, I mean, he couldn't tell I had a hair piece, but uh, he could, my hair was a little fuller because I wasn't losing my hair in the front. It was kind of like in the back so, and across the middle. And it was, I just obviously had fuller looking hair. and He commented on it a couple times. And, I just, I basically, I didn't tell him anything. During this period of time, the 1986 to 1989 period, uh, did your dad continue to have uh, a lot of control over your life? Yes. And did he continue to have control in a very forceful way? Yes. In, in the spring of 1987, did you have a coach named Robbie Klaus? Yes. And did Robbie Klaus have a conversation with you uh, about something your dad had said to him? Yes. Where did this conversation take place? In Florida at a tennis tournament. And what did Robbie Klaus tell you? That my dad 
had threatened his life for uh, suggesting that I become a tennis pro and not maybe not postpone school. And Robbie said he had never said that to him, but uh, that my dad said he was hearing that. When you say Robbie said he'd never said that to him, what do you mean? Robbie told you he'd never told your dad what? He'd never made that suggestion to my dad. Oh, that you drop out of school to go on the right. tour? Okay. But uh, he just said that my dad would, had threatened his life with my mother sitting at the table. And uh, he was just, he was petrified and he, um, basically wanted to let me know that because he was concerned for me and he thought my dad was totally crazy. He was afraid. Did you tell him, you know, dad just jokes a lot, don't worry about it? No, I, I told him that uh, my dad doesn't joke a lot about those things and, you know, he should just relax and go go home and I'll I'll be all right and um, that was the last tournament we were going to do together because he could not coach me anymore and he was just uh, just couldn't coach me he was too afraid well did you tell him that you know that he shouldn't be afraid no you tell uh, if him? my dad felt that he was suggesting that and uh, I felt my dad could do something to him I, I wasn't sure so I, I I found it. No, I didn't know what to think. I just felt that uh, the guy was very shaken by it, and I felt very bad for him, seeing because it was you know, it's humiliating for him also. I just tried to say that that's just the way my dad is, and he should just sort of not coach me is fine, it's okay with me. Um, it, was, it was a sad meeting, but it was also very uh, tense. And uh, I didn't really say much to him. How did you feel? I felt, uh, myself, I felt very uh, shaken, shocked, just, I. I was also, my feelings were more, uh, this is really the first time that I realized that I wasn't going to be doing tennis even after school, that my dad was going into uh, politics. And obviously when we discussed the hairpiece, then I knew for sure. But um, at that point, you know, I, I had the year off and I was, he had hired the coach and we were spending a lot of money traveling around. And uh, he just wanted Robbie to hang out with me till I went back to school. It's basically what was happening. Did you have a tournament to play right after this competition? Yes. Yeah, then we had the satellite tournament. What'd you do? We had had the conversation the night before, and I was just a wreck, and he was, you know, in the same condition. and. Uh, I just couldn't play. I didn't want to play either. So I re <coughs> I played through the first, I think I got through the first set, and then um, I just told the guy I can't play. And to report the scores, because I knew my dad would verify that I lost or not. Um, so I made sure he reported the scores rather than default. And then when that was it, I just withdrew from the tournament. Had you ever done that before? Had no. Some, had you ever seen anybody else ever do that before? No. Why didn't you just default? What would happen if your dad found out you defaulted? <laughs> well, um, I didn't just default unless I had like an, incap an injury where I was incapacitated, couldn't play, and my dad saw that. So I had to play. Um, I played injured, I played sick, so I couldn't just default, and, uh, and he did eventually take my brother to a tournament um, in that area, I believe for Eric's Easter Bowl, and they passed by and they saw the score sheet and he, 
he was able to tell me who had eventually won the tournament. Um, so he had checked up on you? Yeah. Well, what would happen if you just defaulted? What if you said, you know, Dad, I was really upset about your conversation with Robbie, and I couldn't play. Why couldn't you do that? I didn't do it because we had had, uh, you know, he had f physically uh, hurt me when I didn't do things his way, and I just felt that he was extremely tense during this whole period of time because of my mother. It just seemed much more volatile than usual, and I wasn't going to um, really press any issue like that. You were 19 years old at the time? Yeah. You told us that you were suspended from Princeton and then returned in February of 1989, is that correct? Yes. And when you went back to Princeton, was there some arrangement made about the room you were to have? Yes. And what, what kind of room were you supposed to have? We had requested a single room. When you say we had requested, did you request it or did somebody else? No, my dad requested a single room. Um, <coughs> and uh, he had expected that they would grant that, and they usually did, supposedly. Um, when you got there, was the single room available? No. I think they had tried to give me a single room, but it was like in a seven-man area where the seven people lived and somebody had just moved out that lived in a single room in that little area so I guess that was supposed to be mine but since I was coming in mid-year um, the boys had rearranged their rooms and s somebody was already in there. What did you do when you found out the room you were supposed to have wasn't available? Uh, I called my dad. And I Why'd you call your dad? Um, situations like that, I always call my dad immediately. It's better than him finding out another way. How old and were he you? Was uh, <coughs> twenty-one. So you called your dad and said the room I'm supposed to have is not available. Right. Did your dad give you some advice? Yeah, he said I explained him the situation, and he said that obviously was supposed to be my room. And uh, to just the, the boy was off on a lacrosse, no, a crew uh, training trip with the crew team. So my dad told me just move the guy's stuff out. Did you want to do that? I told him I didn't think. Well, I think we should wait till the kid came back, and maybe I could work it out or something. Because if I just move the guy's stuff out, people aren't going to be. I'm not going to get along in that room, but my dad was uh, pretty upset that they had put me in a seven-man room to begin with. He told me, just move the guy's stuff out and call me when you're done. Why didn't you say that? I don't want to do that. They're all going to hate me if I do that. I don't want to do it. Um, I told him that it wasn't a good idea, I didn't think, but I, I couldn't just... Uh, I never said, I just never said no. So did you move the stuff out? I moved the stuff out, and uh, the other kids were, had the reaction I thought they would have. They were very um, <coughs> upset and wouldn't talk to me. And the, when, the, when the guy came back, he moved my stuff out and put his stuff back in and moved my stuff into the hall. I don't want to have a problem with him, so I just um, stayed in the hall. And I actually uh, slept in the hall, had a bed there, and I just lived in the hallway between the rooms, the seven-man rooms. For how long? I'm not exactly sure how long, almost two weeks. I think it was about two weeks. And did something happen then? My dad found out. I don't know how, but he found out. and. Uh, found out that you were in the hall? Yes. Okay. And he was furious that I was in the hall and um, basically didn't want to talk about it. Told me to go down, talk to the head of the college, and demand a new room. 
Did you want to do that? Um, I wasn't happy in the hall, but I, I didn't, uh, I had already checked into it, sort of, and asked if they had any available rooms, explained to them my situation at the housing place, and they said there was nothing they could do, that I was supposed to be in there, and I just have to get along. So I thought the best thing to do was just to stay in the hall until we came to an arrangement, because eventually I would get along better with everybody and we could figure something out. Uh, my dad didn't want me to go to the housing people. He told me to talk to the head of the college, and you tell him that you need a room. And uh, so I went and I requested time with him, and I asked him. And um, they found me a room far away from where I originally was supposed to be in the college I was in. But uh, it was a room that I guess somebody had moved out of or didn't show up or something like that. Was that okay with you to be in that room? Yes. And I moved all my things in there. And I called my dad and told him that I was great. I found a room. And he, uh, I th thought that was fine. It was good. And then uh, eventually, at some point, within a, a day or so, found out where the room was. Your dad found out, you mean? Yeah. Okay. And um, was, a, was really upset again that I had allowed myself to be moved out of the area where I was supposed to live and said that uh, I obviously couldn't handle the situation. He was going to call himself. Um, that made me real nervous. I wasn't sure what he, who he was going to call or what he was going to say, but um, like the next day, I was called in to talk to the head of the college. And what kind of mood was the head of the college in? He said that uh, my dad was an asshole and that nobody had ever talked to him like that before and that he had a new room for me. And he was very uh, hostile to me. How did you feel? I felt like the uh, semester was not starting out very well and uh, really wasn't surprising to me that the guy was in that mood. That's why I was nervous to begin with when he called. I just tried to tell the guy that, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. My dad, I, I liked the other room and he, he said that I was just to chip off the old block, and I was spoiled, and I just wanted a new room. So I had my old old man call and curse him out. Had you had your old had you had your father call him? No. Did you want your father to call him? No. Did you want to stay in that other room that, that you had been given? I wanted to stay in the other room to cause just so I could get on with the semester, and it, it was a good room, and uh, so. I sh Dad was able to get me a, a double size room right next to where I was supposed to be. So you were back around all of the people that you'd been around with in the beginning when you'd had the trouble by moving the guy's stuff out? Yes. Were they friendly to you? They were not friendly to me. Were you happy your dad had interfered in that way? No, I was just complaining to my Aunt Terry that my whole situation at school was so bad that I just would prefer to live with her. And, uh, Did you tell your dad he'd make the situation worse? No. I told him the room was great, you know, and I was settled and there was no more problems and he didn't have to call anymore. Why didn't you tell him? You made things worse. He just didn't uh, tell my dad he was doing the wrong thing. My dad was a, you know, a brutal guy. He was, he did what he wanted. He was a very, you know, even little problems like this, he had very severe solutions and they almost always worked. And uh, if once a problem got to his attention, he handled it in his way. And there wasn't any, you know, you should have done it this way, or I didn't appreciate that, or he'd just tell you to 
I mean, I never even said that, so I don't know what he would say, but that would have been weak, and I wouldn't have done that. Um, it would have been weak if you said, you're hurting other people's feelings, you're making other people not like me. That would have been something you couldn't right. admit to? Yes, because I, I was not supposed to be concerned with what other people thought about me. I was supposed to focus on my goals. And uh, <coughs> he didn't really think that uh, the kids at that school mattered anyway. It was really just the kids' fathers, because my dad was going to take me far beyond whatever these kids could achieve. But he felt that a great number of the kids were there because their dads were powerful, wealthy, connected. And that's where the, con the help was going to come from, the contacts. So, you know, get along with the kids in so far as you can, the fathers will help you out then. And that's why I was at that school. For the contacts? Yeah. You met Donovan Goudreau in February of 89, is that correct? Yes. Did you two become very close friends? We, he was my closest friend ever. How, how much time did you spend with him? Did you see him every day? I saw him, we basically spent all day together and all night um, <coughs> since he stayed in my dorm room. And had, he had, had he had an apartment when you first met him? Yes. And did something happen with his living situation? Yes. And did you then let him stay in what you said was a two-man room? He stayed there, or when, when I stayed at Aunt Terry's, which was more often than not, he stayed with me there. And you said you spent all day with him. Was yes. he a student at Princeton? No. Did he claim to be a student at Princeton? He said that he was supposed to go in the fall and that he had taken time off. They, he said that he had transferred from junior college. And uh, it was a complicated story, but he had transferred from junior college and they wanted him to wait till the fall. <coughs> no, he wanted to wait till the fall so he could get to know the area and since he had driven across the country in his truck. and. So he was working in restaurants there, and he wanted to sort of stay on campus a lot and meet the kids, and that way he could start in the fall. And he was older than the rest of the kids, as I was, so we had that bond, and we became very close. Did you want him to be a close part of your life? <coughs> yes, I thought this could be a friend I could have for my life. And, and if you were going to have someone who was going to be a friend for your life, um, would he have to meet someone's approval? Yes. Whose approval would he have to meet? He'd have to meet Dad's approval. And from the time you first met him, uh, did you begin working with him to help him be a person who could meet your Dad's approval? Yes. I tried to, you know, my Dad had always said that I couldn't really have close friends. It wouldn't work out for lots of reasons, one of them <laughs> being that they weren't trained in the same way that I was. They weren't brought up in the same way. And so I, you know, I knew a lot of the things that my dad respected. Um, and so I basically, tr I really wanted him to, you know, I wanted him to be a part of my life. And in order for that to happen, he had to be accepted in the world I had with my dad. <laughs> and so I went ahead and, you know, I, I helped him memorize all the phrases my dad had had me memorize. Now when you say all the phrases, are these phrases out of a particular book? Yes, the ones I repeated the other day and, and a lot more that... What book are we talking about? The Greatest Salesman in the World. By? Ogmandino. And so this was the book that your dad had used with you? Yes. To train you? Yes. Or one of the books? Yes. And so did you begin training Donovan? Um, yes. How did you train him? We just um, went over and over and over the passages. I give him an understanding of why my dad had me read them, what they meant to him. Um, I t he spent his time when I was in class, if he didn't go to class with me, um, memorizing them. And uh, you know, he was very willing 
and uh, excited about it. And uh, we had lots of long talks about my dad and what he would admire and what he would not. Um, I helped him. Uh, I gave him a, a good idea of the way my dad spoke and not to be rambling on in his presence and how to get an indication of when the atmosphere changed in the room and he would want him to be silent because my dad was very uh, <coughs> fiercely critical of people and uh, especially my friends. I, I had never had a friend that even came close to his approval. But Donovan was a very bright and uh, very excited about this, so it, I thought it could work. What did you mean when you said to be able to sense the change in the atmosphere in the room? <laughs> he, uh, you know, from the way that my dad looked at me, I could tell if he wanted me to stop talking, if he wanted me to, to express myself better, he was kind of disgusted, um, or if he was pleased with what I was saying to other people. You know, by the way, his hands move if he wanted you to stop or, um, you know, obviously there were all the signals for tennis, but even outside of tennis, there were all kinds of cues, um, nodding of his head, um, just the way he said my name, for me to act in certain ways. and. I wanted Donovan to sort of get used to that because if, if in fact, my, I was going to be working with my dad through my life and I wanted him to be a part of that, he would have to get used to my dad's behavior, which was very difficult. And that's why in my dad's business he had brought people from New York who had gotten used to his behavior. And uh, so I worked with him in this way and he seemed to understand what I was talking about. At some point, did you bring him to California to meet your dad? Yes. And did you have particularly intensive training sessions with him before the dinner with your dad? Yes. Uh, we prepared for the dinner talks, which were going to be the most grueling part. Uh, and I didn't think, I'm, I knew he had never had <coughs> dinner conversations like this before. And I just wanted to prepare him as best I could. How did you prepare him? What did you do? We uh, we just played the. I played my dad, basically, and tried to grill Donovan in the way I thought my dad would, with lots of sharp questions and going back constantly to the things he had said. And we spent a like an hour or so uh, doing this, and Donovan answering the questions, and I would explain to him how to do it the way I did, with very short answers, very polite, and not open yourself up to you know, being attacked by him. All right, let's take our recess, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll resume at 20 minutes to the hour. Don't discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else, and we'll resume at 20 minutes to the hour. Mr. Menendez, when we left off, we were talking about the preparations for the dinner with your father. Do you remember? Yes. And did you subsequently have dinner with your father, with Donovan? Yes. And what happened? Um, he just, we had dinner and he grilled him in the way that I had told Donovan he would. And uh, What kinds of things was he asking him? He was asking him uh, mostly personal questions in the beginning, like where he was from, you know, why he was going to Princeton, uh, why he wasn't going in that semester, what were his reasons for waiting, um, did he have any family, what did his dad do, um, just lots of different personal questions, and then uh, wanted to know what he, he thought about life. What was his basic philosophy of life? What do you want to do with his life? Uh, you know, he was going to go to this particular school. Where What was that going to do for him? And uh, he would be jumping back and forth between subjects uh, like I had expected. And Donovan didn't do too well. How did you feel while this was going on? 
I was very nervous, and Donovan was just pale from being nervous. And Why were you nervous? Because I thought that he wasn't going to do well. And no, my, dad, Go ahead. my dad was going to tell me that I should get, get rid of this guy as, as a friend because uh, he was wishy-washy. And you know, Donovan was a very uh, soft guy, and uh, I knew my dad would sense that right away, and that would be a strike against him. And so Donovan really needed to be forceful in these conversations, and he really wasn't doing that as well as I had hoped. And basically my dad said to me afterwards that this guy seems real weak. And How did you feel when he said that? I felt like he was going to tell me <coughs> to stop hanging out with him. You were 21, is that right? Right. Why couldn't you tell him, I like him, I can pick my own friends? Uh, for the same reasons I said before, I um, just didn't say that to, to my dad. Um, he really didn't say that to my mom either, but for different reasons, my mother would just get enraged and completely go off. Uh, my dad would uh, be very short with you and just dismiss you. And uh, I, you know, I needed my dad, and uh, my relationship with him was um, strained and uh, a lot of painful things, but also um, he was there to help me in my life and uh, he kept me up he kept me going at times when I was very depressed or down or distracted um, and nothing seemed really worth it to press the issue on to the point of uh, uh, you know my dad could just summarily dismiss me from his life at some point I didn't want that to happen. Why not? I loved my dad. And uh, I wanted to be a part of his life. Even though he was going to be making all the decisions for you? Um, I figured there would, you know, there would come a time when I would make a lot more decisions. Was he going to pick where you lived? Um, assuming we went to Florida and we did what he wanted to do, yeah. Was he going to pick what career you had in the future? It was going to be political and might be business oriented also. But he mm. was going to pick it? Right. Was he going to pick who you married? He might. He would. Was it okay with you that he make those decisions for you? Um, that's just the way it was. I mean, it's hard to explain, but in my, you know, there was my mom and my dad, and my, my mom had so much control, especially in the later years, through just her own <coughs> ability to inflict you know, just attack people or, you know, he, she had her threats, she had her whole, um, that's how she controlled the things around her was uh, basically <coughs> scaring people and because of her behavior. And My dad just, um, it was like, an, you know, he controlled everything around him in his whole life. And uh, very rarely did I see him disturbed or anything. He just seemed like he was always in control and he was incredibly successful and uh, I wanted to be a part of his life and from early on he was always there and I just um, neither me nor any of my friends could imagine a time when I would just be you know my dad wouldn't be there. Did you think you could make it on your own? I really didn't. Um, Why not? 
just from working with my dad at the business and failing so miserably and uh, really in tennis not ever reaching the, the levels that we had set for me. Um, in school I felt completely inadequate. I was not anywhere near as smart as the kids at Princeton and I uh, could not do their work. Um, I just really felt like uh, I was way, way below what my dad could do. He, he did things sort of by magic and I struggled at the slightest thing and he saw that and we would talk about that and uh, the different flaws and weaknesses and work on them but I never really got to a point where I could I felt uh, comfortable saying hey dad let me let me do this. Did you spend a lot of time talking with your dad about your flaws and weaknesses? We talked about them yeah very regularly. How much time did you spend talking about your strengths? Um, we didn't really talk about strengths, except in tennis. I had some strengths, and we would try to pattern my game around that. But in life, uh, I was pretty much uh, weak and uh, oversensitive, in his opinion, over you know just the whole thing with my girlfriends and. You know, I mean, like with Christy, I was going to keep the baby and marry her. And uh, he was, these things were just stunning to him that I could be so stupid as to throw my life away on things like that that could be corrected. So, you know, I continually had these problems and we talked about them regularly. And I sort of uh, agreed that I was going to have a hard time in the future because um, I, I was never going to be able to control the business meetings anywhere near the way he did. I just, I don't think I could inspire people the way he could um, and, and control them and get them to focus on what he wanted. Uh, yeah, he was uh, something brilliant. And were you something brilliant? No. I wanted to think that, and there were times, times when he told me that um, I was. So there were times he told you you were brilliant? Mm hmm Very often? Um, no, I really remember one time at my Aunt Terry's when we, we had a big, long conversation about these issues and about the fact that I could never be what he wanted, and I could never be as good as he could, even if for somehow I managed to get all these qualities and do what he did, I still wouldn't have started from the same place. I would have started at a school like Princeton, not an immigrant with nothing. And uh, so I talked to him about coping with that. And this talk at your Aunt Terry's, when was this? This was in the uh, spring of 89, around Easter. And were some decisions made about your future at that time, <coughs> in terms of what the yes. expectations were? Yeah, we made a lot of decisions in that uh, conversation in the basement. How long did that last, that conversation? A few hours, like three hours. This is spring of 89, so you're 21. <laughs> right. And you said some decisions were made? Yes. Is this about your future? Yes. And who made these decisions? Um, my dad made them after discussions with me as to um, what he felt I could handle. Um, and I wanted to transfer out of the school. Out of Princeton? Yes. Into what school? University of Pennsylvania. Why did you want to transfer? Or, or even UCLA, some, some school that had business courses um, I felt I was really floundering at Princeton to some degree, at least with the grade level that my dad wanted me to get. I couldn't get that. And also I felt, you know, like I had said, that I really was inadequate to do what my dad was doing, and it was making me nervous that I was sort of getting older and a time would come when he would really press me to 
take on responsibilities, and I didn't know how I was going to learn these things. And I figured, you know, Princeton has no business courses whatsoever. Uh, it's not a trade school in that way. And this University of Pennsylvania or UCLA had the courses, small business courses, corporate courses, things that I could get a grasp of, learn something. So I talked to my dad about that, that it might be a good idea for me to switch, just feeling very insecure about myself. And basically came to an arrangement. Uh, I had always thought I was going to graduate school, and he had decided that I wasn't going to go to graduate school anymore, so I didn't need to get the same grades that all I had to do was pass and get the degree and meet people and you know get the contacts and that was all he wanted out of me for the school and I could concentrate on my tennis there if I wanted and uh, so we basically made that deal and then, and then he in turn would uh, guide me take care of the business end and he obviously had money and he said he was going to have a great deal more money in the future and uh, he'd be able to finance any business I wanted after I graduated if we wanted to start me out in business before I go into politics and he hadn't quite worked it out but uh, basically told me not to worry about it at school just pass um, well did you feel when you got out of school you were going to be capable of doing these things on your own or I didn't, be, but he... Were going to be dependent on him? I would be dependent on him to a great extent. Um, you know, he kept telling me that business was easy and that it was simple and you just had to go about it a certain way and that he would teach me later on that I, I shouldn't be concerned with it now. And uh, so I accepted that. Let's go back. We were talking about your relationship with Donovan. After you had the, the visit with your parents and, and the, the talk with your dad, uh, did you and uh, Donovan return to New Jersey? Yes. And did you continue to be close with him? Yes. And did you continue the same types of talks that you were talking about earlier in terms of philosophy and memorizing things? Yes. And at some point in time, uh, did you have a, a dinner with him that you heard Donovan describe here, a, a dinner in a Chinese restaurant? Yes. And was there some conversation at that dinner about being close and having no secrets? Yes. And did Donovan tell you something in that conversation? Yes. What did he Donovan was, uh, tell you? Being offered for the truth of what I said. No, it's not being offered for the truth of the matter. And it goes to state of mind. And it goes to a prior consistent statement. All right, as to what Mr. Goudreau said, it's not being received for the truth of what was said, just to uh, be part of a conversation that um, occurred and the state of mind of the uh, witness. What did Mr. Goudreau tell you? He told me. Um, it was a very, I could tell that something was coming and he, uh, uh, after some amount of him crying and having a hard time getting out, he told me that uh, he had been molested by his uncle or I believe it was his uncle, another adult and he told me a little about that and was crying and of course this. How did you feel? <laughs> I felt very bad for him. Why? Because I knew how it felt. And did you say something to him? I told him... Uh, did you want to help him? I couldn't help him. I just wanted to comfort him and let Wait. him know that... that you know, he, he felt that made him lesser and weak, and I wanted to let him know that the same thing had happened. I told him, basically, I don't remember exactly what I told him, but <coughs> I had let him know that the same thing happened to myself and my brother, and that uh, it was okay. How did you react when, when you saw him crying and upset? I started to, I don't know if I started crying or almost, but I felt like I couldn't talk. 
and we eventually <coughs> I had to go to the bathroom. Um, came back, and I think he felt better. Why did you feel the need to comfort him? Because he was in tremendous pain. <coughs> I got the impression he hadn't told anybody this before in his life. Um, I was amazed that he had told me. Uh, what was the importance of telling him that it had happened to you? Why did you think that was going to help him? Because I wanted, didn't want him to think that it made him... He was saying it in a way like he couldn't be like m me or something like that. And I wanted him to know that that it was okay and that that, that didn't have any, you know... And the same thing had had happened to me and that uh, and, and to my brother and that that didn't make uh, him anything strange did you feel weak. that about yourself that what had happened to you didn't to make you anything strange well I really hadn't thought about it in a long time And uh, it was somewhat of a good, I felt in some comfort myself that it, something had happened to him, although not really the same thing, but. Um, Why? Why was that comforting that it had happened to him? I don't know. Why hadn't you told people, had you told people before this that you remember except your mother? Why hadn't you told anybody before? Uh, partly fear of my dad, for sure, would be one reason I never would. Um, but also, I was already feeling like an over, we, you know, I had stuffed animals, I had these problems with the girlfriends, and I, I felt uh, so much lesser than my dad. And lots of shameful feelings, embarrassment with, you know, even back when the bedwetting was happening, I mean, I constantly, it was just one thing after another. And uh, I wanted to take, put this out of my mind. And my dad never brought it up. Um, so I, I didn't ever tell anybody. Was it a painful memory? Or a memory that no, didn't matter? It was very, obviously very painful, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't, I really didn't allow myself to think about it until, you know, this is my best friend mentioned, you know, talked about this and he was crying and I just, I could barely talk, but I felt I couldn't not tell him. I just told him. Did you do it for him or to make you feel better? No, I, did it, I think I did it for him. Did it make you feel better to tell him? Yeah, I think we both felt a lot better, for sure. Did that make you even closer? Uh, oh, yes, we made much closer after that. Now, you'd met him in February of 89, is that correct? I think it's February. February or March? Yeah. In May of 89, was that after you'd had this conversation with Donovan that you received a phone call from your dad? Yes. And. What did your dad tell you? Well, my dad told me that he knew about Donovan. Now, did you know what he meant when he said he knew about Donovan? Yes. And what did he mean? Um, I had, f my friends had been telling me that Donovan was such basically a con artist. Um, that, and they were giving me different examples, especially Glenn. Glenn who? Stevens. He'd give you examples of lies that Donovan had Yeah, he said that Donovan had written some poetry 
that he had hanging on his wall that his mother had given him, that recognized his poetry, and that Donovan had showed it to him as if it was his, it had different poems he said he wrote. Um, I think it, the name of it was The Man in the Glass, I'm pretty sure. And uh, he, he said that he had read the paper that Donovan had helped me with at school. Donovan would help me with schoolwork or do some of it and be involved. And that, that Donovan could barely spell properly and the grammar was terrible and, and there was no way that this kid was, had gotten into Princeton, especially transferring. Did Glenn seem to be uh, encouraging you to sever your relationship with Donovan? Yes. Did you want to do that? No. Why? Because uh, I loved him. And so Glenn's giving you this information, and then you get a phone call from your father. Is that right? Um, my dad found out somehow and uh, said that he wasn't enrolled in the school and to move his stuff out. Move Donovan's stuff out? Mm -hmm. And get rid of him. What did you say? And he was furious, and he was saying, you know, this kid lied to my face, and uh, you moved the fucking kid's stuff out. And he knew I wasn't going to want to do it. And I just sort of said, well, you know, maybe he has an explanation, you know, I'll talk to him. And he told me he would fly out and move his stuff out himself. And I definitely didn't want that to happen. Did you so, believe he would do it? Yes, I believed he would do it. And I figured he found out through my Aunt Terry somehow. And I expected him to fly out, but uh, I told him I would handle it. He said, okay. Um, so I had some more talks with Glenn, who also said that the kid, that he wasn't in the school. And uh, uh, although the, there didn't seem to be any way to verify it that we could find. But in any case, uh, I had to get his stuff out. So I told him, I'll just talk to him, and I'll get his stuff out. And uh, they said, no, we want to be in the room with you because we know you. You're going you're gonna to give in to, this, to him, and you're going to allow him to. He, the guy obviously tells you know, lots of different stories. And so they sat in the room. Who's they? Uh, Glenn and Hayden. Um, so we went in the room, I asked, I told Don I needed to talk to him, and I told him uh, that it breaks my heart, but uh, he's got to go. And did it break your heart? It did. And it, uh, he was crying, and uh, he wanted to explain to us why this had all come about, which I now know. Um, the reasons, but um, Glenn basically was rushing me and rushing him, and um, next thing I knew, we were moving his stuff out, and we wouldn't give him a chance to explain. I think one of the my friends made a comment that um, that you know while he was taking time, he, he actually suggested that we leave and he take time to think about getting himself together because he was crying and, and explain to us why this happened. And somebody made a comment that he was just going to steal more things and that he was going to have to go now. And they backed his truck up to the window. Who backed his truck up to the window? Uh, Hayden. And uh, started moving things into the car, Who was into the truck. Things? Who was moving things into the car? Glenn and Hayden and Donovan. <laughs> And uh, it was, we, I took the time to try to sort out what was mine and his because I had no idea on a lot of stuff. We shared clothes, we shared pretty much everything. So we did that, and uh, <coughs> my room was just a shambles. And I felt still like we were rushing him, but. How did you feel when you were cleaning these things out? <sighs> I. I was losing the, the one friend I had, and uh, I really felt in a way that it was going to be inevitable after the conversation in California. But it 
once my dad found out that he wasn't even in Princeton, you know, then he had lost all value to my dad. And so uh, it really didn't matter how I felt about it. You know, he was going to go. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be able to spend any time with him. So How did, how did Donovan seem to and it, and it hurt me that he had not told me the truth. I, I couldn't understand it considering the other things he had told me. And did you confront him with that? Why did you mm, lie? No, I wanted to, but it just, everything happened so fast, I uh, couldn't. Did Donovan appear to be sad? He was crying. Were you sad? Yes. <coughs> I don't know if I was crying or not, but uh, I was very heartbroken over it. So you said that they were putting things into Donovan's truck? Hmm. Yes? Yes. How long did it take for them to get him moved out? Um, after I sorted the things out, not only uh, you know, 20 minutes at the most, put it all in the truck, and then uh, Donovan got in and pulled out to the little street that goes through the campus, and I just watched him leave. How'd you feel? I felt bad for him. How about as for much you? You know, I was very sad over it, and uh, I, I don't know, I thought somewhere, somehow, he and I would get back together. Did you ever see him again after that until you saw him in this courtroom? No. Did you ever talk to him again after that until you... Have you ever had a conversation with him since then? No. We didn't, uh, we had no idea where he lived. Nothing. No. Did you sometime later find that he had left some of his things behind? Yes, he left uh, quite a few things behind in the mess. What did he leave behind? He left a leather sack, like a note, I don't know, what you call it, like a notebook kind of thing, that uh, pouch that had all kinds of effects in it, um, papers, letters things like that. Um, he left, I believe, his typewriter, if I remember, and a bunch of other papers, other things. Um, Did you at some point realize he had left behind his driver's license? Yes. When did you realize he'd left behind his driver's license? Uh, we saw it among the stuff. It was in the, the leather pouch. and. Uh, when you say we saw it? Who saw it? Glenn and Hayden and myself. And was that the day that he left? That you saw it in the leather pouch? Yes. And what did you do with it? <coughs> and his bank card, too. What did you do with those things? Glenn took the bank card. Um, and uh, the, everything else I left there. And uh, basically just left. I mean, I didn't really live there, so I just left everything a mess right there. And I was, that day I was really, uh, you know, down, depressed, and I, I didn't even bother with any of the stuff. And uh, Glenn was going to get, you know, try to do something with the bank card to recover the amounts of money that he had taken from me, uh, which he had taken money. But, uh, and didn't have the pin number or anything, so he wasn't going to be able to do that anyway. I'm sorry? Just a second. Do we, did you at some point see his driver's license? Yes. When? In the room after he left. And where did you place the driver's license and the other papers? If you remember. We didn't, we just left him there. In the room? Mm-hmm. Say yes? Yes. And when is the next time that you saw his driver's license? Uh, my Aunt Terry found it when she cleaned out my room. When was that? That was about a month later or so. Is that the end of the semester? Yes. And was your brother there for that weekend? Yes. 
What did you do with the driver's license? Um, she gave it to me and <coughs> I gave it to Eric. Why did you give it to Eric? So he could use it as a ID since he and Donovan looked pretty much kind of like each other. Why would he need an ID? Because he was underage. He was 18. And Donovan was? At that time, 22. So it's so he could get into places where they served alcohol? Right. After your Aunt Terry cleaned out your room um, and you moved out of Princeton, did you return home to the Beverly Hills house? Yes. And were you <coughs> scheduled to go back to Princeton in the fall? Yes. And how did you feel about going back to Princeton? Much better. Why? Um, because of the arrangement my dad and I had made um, with the grades, which was a very large source of stress for me. And uh, <coughs> that had been alleviated and uh, just felt better. I was playing tennis um, at a high level and uh, I had not been able to play in the spring. Why hadn't you played in the spring? Uh, because of the year suspension, I had a choice. I could either uh, play that spring when I came back, or I could not play in the spring and then play the rest of the years. I, in other words, if I played that spring, I'd have to take my senior year off of tennis. And the coach wanted me to play that spring, told my dad he didn't think it was a good idea for me just to be not playing for a semester. but. My dad uh, told him, no, I'll take the spring off because with my age difference, I was going to be able to compete very favorably uh, collegiately because I was so much older. And uh, he thought, especially my senior year, I might have a good chance at a national championship because of my age and my ability. So take the spring off. So I didn't play tennis all spring. Did you uh, want to play tennis that spring? I wanted to play, and um, occasionally the coach would let me play with the team, but uh, mostly I played with the the girls until I met Isla, or uh, you know played with other lesser people that weren't on the team but were good in the area, because I grew up there, so I knew enough players, so I played with them. So you were going to get to play tennis for So I was going to start on the team, and uh, the guy that was really above me on the team, his name was Jacob Leshley, uh, was gone because he had graduated. And so the expectation was that I would, I would play the top spot and it would be uh, a good year. And um, so, so I was excited about that. You were looking forward to playing tennis. Were you on probation? I was on probation for the pool table in incident. Okay. Were you on probation for your grades also? I was on a academic probation for failing one course, which my dad was not pleased about because um, we had had the agreement that I would pass them all. So my grades did drop, but uh, too low. So they were going to just, I opted to take it again as a fifth course the next year as, instead of just not taking the credits. Um, so I was just going to retake the course. And what was your housing arrangement going to be when you went back? The housing was, um, I told my dad I really wanted to live off campus. Um, and he agreed, especially after the fiasco with Donovan, his feeling was that Hanging out at the school was a bad idea for me. It distracted me. It's a good idea that I'd be off campus. And so we talked about it, and eventually uh, I just wanted to rent something in town close by. Um, the rents were pretty expensive. Um, we were sort of talking about that. And at one point we had arranged maybe to rent a place in town, and my, then my mom was going to get a place next door. And then uh, there were these 
great condominiums in this complex about a mile up the road, a half mile, a mile, something like that. And my dad decided uh, to actually buy me a place so that I wouldn't have to worry. Uh, you know, I could paint it or do what I wanted to do, and it, he would know where I was, and he would own the place. So he bought it. Were you excited about living in the condo? Very excited, uh, especially since I had a kitchen, and I liked that. Uh, Were you, was your mom going to pick out furniture for you? I ex that was the she was supposed to pick out furniture for me, but um, if if for some reason you know she was really in a bad way that summer, so I kind of expected my Terry and I to do it. And was there a place in the condo where your parents were going to stay when they came to visit? Yes, they were going to stay in the other suite. There were two suites in the condo. So so that would be their room basically. Right. And were you looking forward to uh, what your social life was going to be back in Princeton? Um, yes, basically, I was going to be dating, hopefully, um, this girl uh, named Isla. And uh, she was on the tennis team, the girls' tennis team, and I had practiced with her constantly because I had had the you know, I wasn't supposed to play with the team, so I played with her, and um, I called her many times in Austria where she lived over the summer, and I think the expectation was we would date when I got back. Is she a Princeton student? Yes. Do you think your dad, did you think that your dad might approve of her? I think he would have approved of her. It's her family. Um, she came from an illustrious family actually royalty in Austria, and she was a tennis player, and she was very, uh, I think he would have approved. And at some <coughs> point that summer, uh, less than a week before your parents died, did things start to change in your family? Yes. And the Tuesday before your parents died, did you have an argument with your mother? Yes. And what happened in that argument? Where was the argument? Um, in the den of Beverly Hills house. Who was there? Just my mom and myself. Did at some point your brother show up? Um, late few minutes later, yeah. What happened in that argument? Do you remember what the argument was about? Or um, was it just... Not exactly. I, I believe it had to do with my hairpiece. I mean, it definitely at some point had to do with my hairpiece. I don't know what, why I was talking to her exactly, but... And in the course of the argument, did she start yelling at you? Yes, she was completely out of control, uh, just flailing her arms and uh, screaming at me about how I was going to be the cause of her father's death. Why were you, why was, <coughs> let me go back. Had your brother been playing at a tennis tournament uh, just before this? Yes. And where was the tennis tournament? In Michigan. And were there some travel plans that were supposed to take place after the tournament? Yes. What were those travel plans? Um, they were gonna, the three of them were gonna go visit my mom's dad in Canada. Who's the three of them? Eric and mom and dad. And why were they gonna go visit your mom's dad? Um, because my mom said that he was very ill and possibly dying, and that this might be the last time she had a chance to see him. And did they end up going to Canada to see her father? No. What happened that they didn't go to Canada? My brother lost earlier in the tournament than my dad had expected. Um, 
he was furious. Who was furious? My father. And uh, decided he wasn't going to Canada. And to hell with my mom's mother, I mean, dad. And uh, so he made arrangements to fly back. And why, why didn't your mother just go on to Canada with Eric? Were you told why your mother didn't go to Canada with Eric? Yes. What were you told? That was because he might have a girl like Louise waiting for him in L.A. while she was with her dad. She didn't trust him. So uh, she wouldn't leave without him. So what did they do? So they all came back early. And was your mom, did your mom continue to be upset about the fact that she didn't get to go see her dad? Yeah, she was more than upset. She was uh, really as bad as I'd seen her as far as anger. Um, really blamed myself in a way that it was our tennis that was going to cause her father's death. And but you hadn't been the one that lost. It was Eric. Right, right. But um, you know, when my mom goes off, um, she talks about your whole life. She brings everything into it. You born and ruined her dreams, and just your tennis had take ruined her life, and you're ungrateful and it's spoiled, and just it just builds. And she works herself into this frenzy where she's just completely out of control and uh, will grab things and throw them. And this conversation, she was out of control right away. And she had been out of that way for since she had gotten back. Um, very down, angry, cold, and then just these explosions. And uh, at some point, at this point, I was having trying to have a conversation with her because she was in in the den and seemed a little more relaxed, but she just exploded. Um, and about something about my hairpiece. Did she do something? Mm -hmm. How long did this discussion, this argument, this rage go on? Not very long. Um, about a minute and a half, two minutes. What That's, did she do? At some point, uh, she was moving toward me, and I kind of put my arms up because she flails with her fists sort of wildly, and she reached and she grabbed my hairpiece, and she just uh, ripped it off. How was your hairpiece attached? It's attached through uh, like a solvent glue. Under the skin? Under the skin. And what happened when she ripped it up? How did it feel? Well, it's it pain um, because you're supposed to use this blue chemical to detach it, and uh, I mean you can rip it off. Uh, but you know, my I looked in the mirror, my head was welling up, and that was my eyes had tears in them from the pain more than the embarrassment. And, uh, Why were you embarrassed? Your mother knew you had a hairpiece, didn't she? She knew, yeah. What was embarrassing about this? Just, you know, being there in the house without it and her having ripped it off was just unbelievably embarrassing. And then my, and my brother was there also. When did your brother come in? I'm not sure when he came in or if he was already in the house, but he, he was standing by the doorway when I started going toward her to get the hairpiece back, and she threw it back to me. And uh, my brother was just sort of standing there. What did you think when she had the hairpiece? What did you think she was going to do with it? I thought she was going to, well, she was going upstairs, and uh, I, for some reason she stopped, turned around and threw it at me, and said, you don't need your fucking hairpiece. And... Uh, But, I, you know, she threw it at me, so I got it back. I only have one. Did it worry you that she was going to take it away? Yes, it worried me she was going to take it away. Why? It just, that's just something my mother would do. Just keep it until my dad got home. 
which wasn't going to be for a few days. Um, so I was going to go upstairs and try to get it from her if I could. And what happened when you noticed your brother was there? Um, nothing. I just looked at him and uh, just really in shock over the whole thing. More my mother's just that she would do that. I never uh, had never happened before, and she had had rages before close to me hitting me. And so I, I left. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to talk to my brother. So I Why left. didn't you want to talk to your brother? Well, he never. He didn't know I had a hairpiece, and so uh, you know, my brother and I. There are things we don't talk about, and that was one of them. And Were you embarrassed in front of your brother? I was completely embarrassed in front of my brother. So what did you do? So I went back to uh, the guest house where I live to put it on, back brother, on. Did your brother follow? Um, I was in the bathroom, you know, putting it on with the temporary glue that they gave us. And he came in and said he wanted to talk to me. And I told him. And I'd be out in a few minutes, and I eventually came out. He was Why didn't you let him come in and talk to you while you were putting it back on? Because I was embarrassed. And uh, I was embarrassed. So I, I waited. How were you emotionally? How did you feel? Uh, I was still, you know, I was very uh, basically trembling kind of thing from just the overall embarrassment of the whole thing and the shock of the, my mother's reaction. Um, so I really didn't want to talk to my brother. Were you angry at her? Um, I was angry, but uh, that was sort of washed over by the whole shock of the whole thing. So did you finish putting your hairpiece on before you talked to your brother? <coughs> yes. And when you came out, did you have a conversation with him? Yes. And did you talk about your mom or the hairpiece? <coughs> what was the conversation? He talked. He wanted to talk to me. And uh, I could tell something was wrong. Because he was sitting in, on the sofa, real um, timid. And, uh, How, what did he look like physically? He started <coughs> to lean forward, did he? Yeah, he was just sitting on the sofa like this. His Hunched head, over? Yeah, his head was down, and he just, I came in, he kind of looked up at me, and he looked down, and he said, I want to talk to you. And uh, I figured it was about my hairpiece or something, but it seemed like something was wrong, and uh, something was wrong. What did he say? State of mind, Your Honor. All right. The objection is sustained. The answer will be received only to uh, reflect the state of mind of the witness, Mr. Lyle Menendez. What did your brother say to you? He told me that, uh, I mean, there's Zach Warriors, but he, he was very sad about the fact that he said we didn't, we weren't a family because uh, there were so many secrets and that a basic saying that you know he had never known about my hair piece which I knew and that he was sorry that that happened and that he wished he had known and um, I didn't have to be embarrassed and how did it make you feel when he was trying to comfort you this way not good embarrassed why embarrassed <coughs> you love your brother don't you rephrase the question why were you embarrassed you and your brother what kind of relationship did you and your brother have? Uh, what kind of relationship did you and your brother have this Tuesday in August, the 15th, I believe the date is? Extremely close, and I was more his, the person, he, he mostly came to me and uh, when he had problems and, and, you know, like the gang thing or whatever it was that were problems, he would come to me. And, uh, but we didn't, there were a lot of things we didn't share and didn't talk about 
because there wasn't, at least on my end, because there wasn't anything you could do. I mean, he, there was nothing he could do with the decisions my dad make if I didn't like them. And there was nothing he could do about what was going on in the house between mom and dad. So a lot of times we just hung out and we were close. But like he was saying, there were a lot of things that we didn't talk about. Um, you know, some things I would never have talked to him about, like what happened to me. But uh, and that's essentially what he told me. He, he went, uh, he asked, you know, he went on about how we weren't a family and that I was, I was the only person he had. And he asked me to remember back to the time when I confronted my dad about him. And uh, you know, I remembered. I said yes. And uh, you know, I asked him what was wrong, because he was really didn't want to. It, it was like you know, he was basically shaking. And um, I asked him what was the matter. And. Uh, at some point, he, you know, he couldn't tell me, and he just started crying. And I said, you know, you could tell me. What is it? And uh, he told me that those things with his dad were still going on. And uh, I was just completely not believing. And, what did you uh, say to him? I said, what things? He said, you know, you know what things. Uh, does and I, I said, how come you didn't tell me before? I, I said a lot of nasty things to him, basically. What did you say to him? I asked him if he liked it. I asked him why he didn't tell me a long time ago. I asked him uh, why he didn't fight back, because he said that Dad was forcing him. And he was just crying. He had no answers for any of it. Just crying. Were you mean to him? Um, unintentionally. But you were mean? Yes. And uh, that made me... You know, I was... I don't know. If, I was feeling extremely guilty. <laughs> Why were you feeling guilty? I was... I was feeling guilty because... Um, You know, I had, you know, the 13-year-old conversation, I had just sort of let go, and uh, I never really followed up on it. I didn't really want to follow up on it. I was so happy it went that well with my dad, and I just kind of let it go. And he told me this, and I was kind of like, and it, he didn't say that, but I felt like, you know, why didn't I do anything about it? Like what? he was blaming you somehow? Maybe. He wasn't, but I felt that way. Were you way. blaming you? Yes. And uh, also feeling guilty when I asked him if he liked it. And, uh, what did he do when you asked him if I he liked it? I was angry. What? What did he do when you asked him if he liked it? What did he do? Yes. He said, of course he didn't like it. And uh, he just, I don't remember exact, exact words, but he, How was, was, he, he was crying. And I told him, you know, I believed him. Uh, and I did believe him. Why did you believe him? You didn't believe him at first. Rephrase the question. Did you believe him at first? Um, not really. I, I really, I wasn't sure. I just didn't. It was the shock. <coughs> that was just my response. What made you believe him? Um, just the way he was talking about it. Just his tears and... Um, I mean, it was obvious that it was true, and uh, and I, I just didn't feel my brother was going to, you know, there was no reason to lie. Clearly, he was coming to me, wanted me to do something about it, and, uh, and it was true, because, you know, my dad never denied it when I talked to him about it. So, I, you know, I knew it was true. So after you got through telling him you didn't believe him, Ask him why he didn't fight back and everything like that. Then did you, did you talk to him differently about it? 
Yes, when he, you know, when he started crying, that was very hard for me. And so I sat down with him and told him to relax and let's talk. And uh, I was very shaky myself, just from the the idea that you know my dad was still doing this and um, basically uh, trying to think about what we could do. Did he want you to do something, or did he just want to tell you? I got the sense he wanted me to do something. That's why he was telling me for the first time. What did you think he wanted you to do? Help him somehow. He, he had no answers. He was, you know, my, at that time he was suicidal. Um, and why do you say he was suicidal? What do you base Just that in on? talks with him over the summer. He was very depressed. My, my dad had been um, extremely rough with him. Um, you know, I saw my dad punch him. I saw my dad be forceful with him over his grades at school, and he was having problems with the chemistry course or something like that. And uh, he was feeling like he was sort of falling apart over the summer, although he was having some success at tennis. And when he lost this time and he came back home, I knew how depressed he was. And uh, you know, so I was, I was concerned for that. And, and then when he was telling me this, I thought part of it was just to tell me, but also to, to want me to do something because he might kill himself. Did you want to do something to help him? Yes. And did you, uh, did you think of a solution? I mean, did you have a, an well, idea of how you were going to handle this? Yes. What was your idea? Just to tell my dad the same thing that I had done before that, you know, obviously didn't work, but I was able to talk to him about it. Basically, I told my brother, and we discussed it, and I told him that I felt I could sit down with Dad when he came back, and essentially, you know, we held all the cards, and if and if I needed to, you know, I could threaten to tell people. What and do you I mean? You held all the cards. Well, insofar as that, that I could threaten to uh, tell people. Obviously, this is something that would ruin my dad. And uh, but this is a man that you couldn't tell to stay out of what room you lived in or right. who your girlfriend was or how could you how how did you think you could tell him this because of what was happening to my brother you know I mean I had no choice at that point my brother had told me and he obviously wasn't going to go on with it he was trying you know I felt he was going to maybe try and kill himself or something of that sort and I told him you know I was glad he came to me obviously and, and I was still in shock of this whole thing, but I, I felt like I'm, I was going to talk to my dad. I was going to stand up for my brother. I had hurt him in the past this way, and um, I needed to do something. And, and I really believed that my dad would uh, let him go. Why? What did you have that was going to give you all this power over your dad? Just really nothing except for that I knew, and, and that was enough. Why? Why wouldn't your dad say, go ahead, tell anybody you want? Well, I, you know, he, I could ruin him with this. He, and uh, I thought he would, once he knew that I knew, and I, I was making him a, I was, we were going to make a great deal with him. I was going to go in there and just say all we wanted was for Eric, for it to stop, obviously, and then for Eric and I to go to the same school. And that's it. And, uh, you know, no retaliation, no, no you know, nothing uh, of that sort, no exposing him, which I knew would be his number one concern really only concern and uh and he knew i could do that obviously he would know that and so i, f I really felt if i just mentioned it to him that i knew and that it was going to stop and I, if i was forceful and i wasn't weak with it um 
he would have no choice. At so, least that's what I felt uh, that day. Were you, once you thought about it, were you fairly confident that this would work? We were very confident, much more than we should have been. And uh, my brother seemed relieved, although very nervous, about me talking to my dad. And it you know, started to set in for me that this might not go as well as I hope. But I still felt like, what, else, what could he do? Did you feel an obligation to your brother? I mean, why didn't you just say, I'm really sorry, it's too bad, and I'm headed back to Princeton soon, and I hope it works out? Why didn't you say that to him? And I would never have said that to him, and he would never expect me to say that. Why? Just because we were brothers. Did he stay with you in the guest house that night, or did he go back into the main house? He stayed with me in the guest house, and uh, I had a king-size bed, and we slept there. And uh, I sort of stayed up and thought about What did you think life. about? I thought back, and uh, mostly I was trying to not think about my conversation with my dad. And I was just going back and trying to figure out how this could have happened without me knowing for so many years. And um, I basically felt that it could. Why? How could it have happened in the house that you were in for at least a substantial part of the time? Rephrase the question. You said you thought about how it could have happened without you knowing. Did you come up with an answer to that? Only that uh, you know, I hadn't talked to my brother, and I, hadn't really, I really didn't know any details about what happened. And, uh, but I felt that, uh, based on what had happened to me, that I'm sure it had happened in his bedroom, times when I wasn't there. And I felt like you know, my dad lectured us behind closed doors, and you know, punishments were always behind closed doors. I got beaten behind closed doors. And you know, at times when cousins were living in the house, and I felt like uh, this is something that was going on behind the doors. Were there and, times when you would see your dad in Eric's bedroom? Yes. Would and, you have uh, ever gone in when your dad was in there with no. Eric? Nobody would have gone in. Why? That was just that was the rule from when we were real little. It just did not go in when my dad was in there with either my brother or myself. Nobody ever came in. Um, and I also thought about how my brother sort of, how he could have fought back, just things like that, just wishing that he could have done something. Did you stay up most of the night? Stay up all night. Were you troubled by this? We were both the world was they're going to be different. Did you think you were going to have no relationship with your family after this? No, no. We, uh, well, I don't know what my relationship, my Eric's relationship was going to be, but um, I sort of, I expected that mine wouldn't change, hopefully, with my dad. You know, I still expected to go to school, although Eric with me. Uh, unless I could transfer in time, maybe go to UCLA with it, where Eric was supposed to go. Um, but I really didn't expect the change. I mean, at that point, I figured my dad knew that I would have to do something about this, and I don't, didn't feel he would hold that against me. And um, I figured my brother's 18 years old. You know. I don't know how long he expected. I don't. I didn't know why it was going on. But I had, you know, I had always thought that that was something. I just dismissed what happened to me as something that happens to little boys. And uh, I really, even at the time when I confronted my dad before, I thought it was a strange thing because my brother was already 10 years old or so. And at 18, I figured my dad would let him go and. Uh, 
I didn't know why it was going on, but that he would, I felt confident that it would work out and I wasn't going to mention it to anybody. And as long as my brother was okay, we would just got to go on. Was your dad at home at the time or was he gone? He was gone. When was he due to come back? On Thursday. All right, let's take our recess. It's at uh, the noon hour. We'll resume at 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. And we'll resume at 1.30. Mr. Menendez, before we broke for lunch, you were talking about Tuesday night, which would have been the 15th of August. You said you stayed up most of the night? All night. And why were you staying awake late at night? <coughs> Just couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. No, because of what had happened with Eric and conversation, just, you know, he was also sleeping there with me. Did you somehow feel responsible for what had been happening to Eric all that time? What were your feelings about, what were your feelings about what your brother had told you in terms of your role in it? I felt that, um, uh, I basically didn't, I just felt like there was, didn't seem like there was anything he could do, and uh, I tried to think what I would do if what happened with my dad had continued, and uh, it was hard to imagine, but uh, you know, I couldn't get out of my mind uh, you know, what had happened between my brother and I. And so I, in that way, I did feel uh, responsible. Um, did, did you ever think, well, you know, maybe he should go to somebody else for help? Maybe he should talk to one of your relatives instead of you, that you weren't the right person to take care of this? No, I figured if I wished he would have come to me a, a long time before. And I, I can't imagine he would go to anyone other than me. Wednesday morning, or Wednesday during the day, did you uh, spend any more time with your brother? Wednesday morning? Wednesday, Wednesday during the day. Wednesday during the day. Um, we went, we spent the whole... <clears throat> That part of the day together, we went to uh, um, UCLA and went to get something to eat at um, the Olive the Olive Garden restaurant there in Westwood. And we had lunch. We talked about the, f the future. And um, what did you talk about about the future? Just keeping spirits up that things are going to work out with Dad, and uh, he was going to be with me. Um, it looked like it was going to be Princeton at first, and uh, his life was going to change, and that's what I, that was the main thing we wanted, and um, basically just optimism about the fact that what choice did Dad have, and uh, he was going to be uh, free, and uh, his life was going to change, and that it would be great for me to have him at Princeton, and I'd always wanted to be close to him. And there had been a conflict way back when I wanted Eric to go to Princeton with me, and Dad wouldn't allow that. I wouldn't even let him apply. He didn't want us together. So now we would be together, maybe. Did you talk to your mom at all that day? I talked to her in the afternoon or early evening. And uh, I wanted to uh, get her to maybe, I was starting to feel, even though we had had this conversation, my brother and I felt optimistic. I just felt like, uh, because of my dad's pride, maybe my mom, who seemed to have so much you know, power in the family right at that point, uh, she could convince him to let Eric go. Based, just felt that uh, all those 
feelings that she had against myself and, uh, and really my brother at that point in her life, I could use that to uh, my advantage and she might be able, she would probably agree, uh, you know, get rid. How could you use those feelings to your advantage? Um, just, to, you know, once I gave, told her what the situation was, um, that she would, I figured she'd be uh, ecstatic to talk to Dad and basically uh, get Eric out of the house and and sort of be more rid of us farther away and, and possibly uh, f feeling that she could cause a rift between my dad and I with this information, which I didn't think that she could do. But uh, at the very least, she would help me because I, re I definitely felt the two of them would talk about it. And um, so I, I went to get her help for that. And what did you say to her when you, went to, when you talked to her? I talked to her in her bedroom and just told her. I don't remember. I just I remember telling her that that there were going to be some changes uh, with regards to Eric living in the house, probably, and uh, possibly even going to live with me at Princeton. She wasn't understanding this, and I don't remember the whole con but conversation. But basically, um, I said that I had to explain, and I said that. Dad was doing things to Eric that I had found that out. And she said, what things? And she got very angry, and I said, sexual things. And she just exploded again, similar to she had Tuesday, and said that basically all I remember is she's saying that Eric's lying and coming toward me and saying, if I want to talk to my dad, I, I mean, if I want to, I don't remember exact words, but basically that I was going to have to deal with my dad. She wasn't going to talk about it, and I couldn't get her to stay and talk about it. And so she left, and I just left. Did you try to get her to stay and talk about it? Um, I continued talking to her, but when you know she was in a rage, you couldn't talk to her. I wasn't going to get close to her, and uh, so afterwards, I told my brother I had a conversation with her and it hadn't gone very well. Did you tell him the details of the conversation? Um, well, not really. I didn't tell him, uh, I didn't tell him that I had actually told her what was going on between he and my dad. Why didn't you tell him? Just, I just, yeah, you know, I felt it was a big mistake, basically, the conversation. And, uh, Why did you think it was a big mistake? I mean, I thought it was risky going into the conversation. I didn't, I didn't really want to, I was hoping that, you know, it would be helpful and it turned out to be um, the opposite effect and she was angry and she was clearly going to go talk to my dad now in a, a different tone than I had wanted her to and um, I just felt that my brother would think that it would have been stupid and very upset that now his mother knew. So you and I just I basically I didn't want him to be angry with me, so I didn't tell him. So you felt you'd made a mistake? Yes, I had. Did you uh, talk to your mother anymore on Wednesday? No. Did you talk to your dad at all on Wednesday? No. Was he home? No. What day was he supposed to come home? Thursday. When did you expect him to come home? What time? Thursday. Um, oh, uh, my mom told me sometime in the evening, and I believed it was eight o'clock as she told me. And what were you going to do when he got home? I was going to talk to him, like my brother and I had discussed, <coughs> and tell him what we had decided, or what I had decided. Did you do anything to prepare for this talk? Well, I spent the. <coughs> That whole evening in the, uh, I'm not sure exactly how long, but I spent many hours in the living room um, just preparing notes and taking notes and uh, deciding exactly what I was going to say, writing it out, and then... Uh, why, why were you preparing notes and writing it out? 
Well, um, you know, I'd never really, I mean, I did have the conversation before like, with my dad, but that was, we were much older now, and this is going to be a very, and my dad's, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, he seemed a little bit, uh, he seemed like a very angry person and at that point in his life, and I was, had just great concern that I was going to end up uh, failing in this conversation. I was going to start crying. I had a problem with crying whenever I talked to my dad, uh, not being able to get the words out. And this conversation was so important. And uh, I was, couldn't let my brother down at that point and had to go ahead with it. And I was being kind of queasy. And so I, I figured that the shorter the conversation, the better. The fewer words, the better. And um, so I wrote it out, and I was just trying, trying to make it shorter and shorter and just get across what I wanted to get across. How many times and, did you write it out and rewrite it? A few times and cross things out and just had my notes with me when he came home. And how were you feeling while you were waiting for him to come home? Very nervous, thinking that I was going to screw up. Did he show up at the time that you expected? No, uh, my mother said his flight was postponed. How'd that make you feel? Um, <coughs> I didn't think she was telling me the truth, actually. So I didn't really feel anything other than that she was she was lying. I, you know, I was confused by the time change, and I thought, because I just couldn't think of any reason why the flight would be delayed coming into L.A., and I just thought maybe she hadn't told me the real time, thinking I was going to leave and she was going to get to talk to Dad first. But then I thought um, she would probably just meet him at the airport and so on, so maybe that wasn't it. So I didn't really know what to think, but she did say it was changed to quite a bit later, like... I think somewhere around 11. What effect did that have on you? Did it calm you down? Or no, I had an, another few hours, and I was already just, you know, wanting to get it, get into the conversation with him and get through it, and it just made me more nervous. And uh, my brother also called at some point, very nervous. He was in Westwood, and we had, to, you know, he had left the house earlier with the understanding that he would be in Westwood, hanging out until I was done talking to Dad. He didn't want to be in the house, and uh, so he called in to see what happened. I told him nothing. It's his flight's postponed till real late, so he said he would come back later. And did your dad eventually get home? Yes. And what was his arrival at home like? What do you remember about that? Um, I remember him, uh, I remember the limo arriving, hearing it come in the carport. I remember, uh, the bag was in the, you know, the living room, and my mother came into the foyer, and, uh, he came in like he always does, kind of like, you know, went over to say hello, hello kitty, and like a hurricane, you know, just bags all over the place, and real, uh, up in spirits, and uh, he saw me, and I told him right away um, that I needed to talk to him. And he kind of looked at me, uh, disappointed. What did he do next? He went upstairs. Uh, he told me he was going to go change, and uh, he went upstairs with my mother. And and he, was it, he told me to wait in the study where we always had our talks. Was it unusual for you to say you wanted to talk to him? It was very unusual. and um, might have happened before, but it, that would almost never happen. Certainly not, not, not in any big issue. So he goes upstairs to change his clothes. How long before he comes back down? Maybe like a um, half hour, 45 minutes. Somewhere around there, maybe maybe not that long. I can't remember. It seemed like a long time. And where is your mother during this time? Mom was upstairs with that. And he had told you to wait for him in the study. Is that correct? Right. Did you go into the study as soon as he told you to go in there? Yeah. Did you remain in there? Mm-hmm. Yes. Did you 
go up the stairs and say, what's taking so long? I need to talk to you. This is important. Or no, I remember sitting on the couch. Um, I think it was the little green couch. And uh, I remember wanting to get my notes out of my pocket to look at them because I was starting to blank out. And uh, too afraid. I didn't want a dad to catch me, obviously, with notes. So that would be the first sign of weakness. So I didn't look at him and I just waited and I tried to think about what I wanted to say, but I was real nervous. And he came down. And what happened when he came down? Did he come into the study? He came into the study um, and he sat in the, uh, the higher chair that we have there. So a chair that was higher than where you were seated? Mm -hmm. Yes. And. Uh, um, the first thing I noticed is that he hadn't changed, which actually didn't surprise me, but um, made why me nervous. You, why do you say it didn't surprise you? I, was, I knew that he would be talking to my mother upstairs, and I, I knew that that was why he wanted to go upstairs, was to talk to my mother. At least that's what I felt. And he came down in his suit, and... Uh, with his jacket off, and he just sat there and he lit a cigarette, and he waited. Did he say anything, like, what's going on, or what do you need to talk to me about, or did he just sit there and wait? No, he just waited. And what did you do? Um, I waited, and we had this awkward period, um, just to, waiting for my dad to talk first, because he always does. Uh, and. Uh, Eventually I realized he wasn't, and so I just sort of went ahead with what I had planned to say as best I could. What did you which say? Which was then? that, that I, I knew everything that was going on between him and Eric, and that it had to stop, and that it had to end, and that I didn't want to disrupt the family, and I wasn't going to tell anybody, but that um, there had to be some changes, and if, if I had to, we would come out of the house, we would leave the house if he didn't want us to live there, but that we wanted to live there for now. And um, I wanted to take Eric to Princeton with me and then maybe transfer to UCLA. And that uh, this, is, this had to happen and that uh, I meant it. How did you feel when you were telling him all this? Um, sort of just really worrying about the words more than anything. And did you say it all at one time like you did here, or did you say something and then he said something? No, I, he didn't say anything. He was looking around the room, and uh, you know, he had his cigarette lit, and uh, he was, I remember he was playing with his ear like he does a lot. Um, did he look at you at all during this? He didn't time? look at me at all, which, which at some point I, I was sort of rambling, trying to get all the words out. At some point I realized I had finished saying what I was saying, and I stopped, and uh, we had another silence. And then he said... Uh, Did he continue looking around and playing with his ear during the silence? Or did he change? Well, I don't remember, but at some point, once I stopped, he asked me if I was finished. And then I said that I was. and. Uh, he put his cigarette, he had crossed his legs, his legs were crossed, he put his cigarette out. And uh, then he started talking. And did his position change or did he just? No, that, well now he was looking at me and he was, he was basically looking down at me so I was pretty far below him. Because um, this couch sort of, you sunk back in it and uh, He said what he said, which is... What did uh, he say? Basically, I, he said, you listen to me. What was his tone of voice? Very, uh, his, his usual tone of voice when uh, you had better understand what he was saying. Can you do it? Uh, Can you imitate it? Pretty well. Can you show me? He just said, you listen to me. And... Um, what else did he say, and if you can do it the way he said it to you? I remember most of what he said. He said, uh, um, what I do with my son is none of your business. And he said, uh, I warn you, don't throw your life away. 
just stay out of it. I remember that. And then he said something else, and then he, he said that, uh, let me tell you what's going to happen. He said, you're going back to Princeton, and your brother's going to UCLA like we planned, and we're going to forget this conversation ever took place. And when he finished talking, um, what happened? I interrupted him. He didn't get to finish talking. Oh, he started saying this, and I knew what was happening. It was just like our other conversations we had where he was just dismissing it. And uh, I told him, I swore and told him he was a, a fucking sick person. And I told him no, and that he wasn't going to touch my brother again. And I threatened him. How did you threaten him? I told him that I would tell everybody all of I tell I would tell everybody everything about him. And I would tell the police, and that I would tell the family. And uh, Did you I was that? I was yelling, and it was pretty. Um, I may have said some more things and swore at him or something. And uh, as soon How as I. How were you feeling? I was feeling like it was. I was losing control of the conversation. It wasn't going to go well. I, I had a feeling it wasn't going to go well. And uh, I also was bracing myself for a punch or some something physical. And uh, and he was. It seemed like he was going to do that when I uh, was saying those things to him. So I don't think anybody had ever spoken to him like that in his whole life. Were you pretty out of control when you were? I, mean, uh, I was you pretty. Did it on purpose, or were you? Had you lost control? No, I was. I was. I had lost control because I had. We. My brother and I had discussed me uh, not threatening him, if at all possible. And I didn't really think that I was going to have to, and I ended up just doing it. And uh, that was a mistake. So you, you're screaming at him, you're telling him he's sick, and you're going to tell everybody. Right. What's he doing while you're doing this? Well, he, he seemed like he was going to uh, attack me in some way, or just, I don't know, he was leaning forward, uh, his legs are uncrossed, and um, that's basically all I remember. And then when I, after I threatened him, his demeanor changed pretty drastically. How did it he, change? He just, he, he sort of relaxed, he sat back, and he just sort of looked at me, and that made me stop. Um, because he happened? seemed so relaxed. What happened after then, you stopped? Then he said, um, he said, we all make choices in life, son. Eric made his, and you've made yours. And then he just looked at me, and he got up to leave. What did you think? I thought, oh my god, he thinks I'm going to tell people, regardless. I knew what he was thinking, and I told him, I started pleading with him before he left. I got up and said, Dad, you know, I, I'm only going to tell people if you don't stop touching Eric, if it doesn't stop. And uh, he just looked at me and said, you're going to tell everyone anyway. And he left. And I sat back down, thinking that it was a disaster, and that my brother was in we were in, I just made it a hundred times worse. What did you think was going to happen? I thought we were in danger. I thought he had no, he felt he had no choice. But to what? That he would kill us. That he would get rid of us in some way. Why? Because he thought I was going to ruin him. And he was going to tell my mother what I said. And I knew immediately what her reaction would be. You can never let that happen to us. And uh, what do you mean to never let that happen to us? What do you mean by that? Well, their image was their life. At least that's my, that's how I felt, especially about my mother. And I don't know if my, what my, you know, I really, I thought afterwards about exactly what my dad was thinking that I was going to do because I would never have ever told anybody. But I did make that threat, and I think he just felt that maybe my own stuff with him, or I was trying to get revenge or something. Or, I'm not sure what he thought. Why do you say you wouldn't have ever told anybody? 
I don't. I would never have. I would not have done that to him. I would never have told people. It was really an idle threat. I never had thought about telling people. I didn't know who I was going to tell. I wasn't going to tell the police. I wasn't going to tell relatives. I would have taken my brother out of the house before I had this conversation, but uh, I wouldn't have just told people. How long did you stay in the den after your dad left? Um, not long. I went back I made it, I pretty much after I thought about the conversation a few minutes, I went straight to the guest house and waited for Eric and figured he would uh, be coming home. And did you see Eric later on that night? Yes. When was it that you saw Eric? I saw Eric. How much after the conversation? Not very long. I don't remember how long, but not very long. And I saw him with Mom. And what were the Actually, I heard the screaming between Eric and Mom, and then I heard my brother running up the, uh, I live on the second floor, heard him running up the stairs and opened the Where door. Where did you hear the screaming from? From outside? Just outside, yeah, house? just outside. And could you tell what the words were, or you could just hear the voices? Um, I couldn't tell what the words were, but I knew it was my mother and Eric. And did they come inside at some point in time? Eric came in, running in first, <coughs> saying, screaming that Mom knows, Mom knows. And I sort of grabbed him and said, you know, Mom knows what? And, and he said about Dad and I. And uh, he was screaming and he was crying too. Um, then I didn't have a chance to talk to him again because my mother came running in up the stairs. Um, you know, just extremely upset from the conversations she had had with Eric. And uh, so you said you you tried to calm Eric down, or you grabbed Eric in some way, and then your mother came in. Mm -hmm. What did you do after that? I uh, confronted her. Just, I, you know, I reacted from what Eric said and just accused her and said, "How can you not have done anything? How could you have known?" What did you say? I mean, were you saying it calmly like you are now, or...? No, I was yelling, too. You had to yell to get anything in when my mother was in that state. And, uh, so I was yelling. What uh, were you yelling? Something to the effect of how could you... How could you not have done anything? How could you know? I don't remember the exact words. And she immediately said that I knew. I had known what was going on. She said nobody ever helped her. And then... Did you know uh, what she meant by that? Nobody ever helped her? No. Although I could guess. But... Um, then I said something about that I... How could she say that I knew and I didn't do anything and we were yelling and... At that point she just um, said she hated us and swore at us and called us a bastard and and just ran out of the room and racked down the stairs. And then uh, my brother and I started talking. What did you and your brother start talking about? Well, he was, as soon as my mom left, he started screaming that Dad was going to kill us. And that, um, and that Mom knows and, and they're going to kill us. And I said, what did Dad say? How do you know that? And I tried to get out of him what had happened. And uh, he, because it was something, had, he said something had happened to him in, in the room. Dad had come upstairs, I guess he had gone up to his room, and Dad had found him in his room or heard him in the room and done something to him, which um, I don't remember exactly what he said he did, but he did something to him. And had started yelling at him about how he had uh, screwed up and betrayed him and he had told me and now I was going to ruin him and that he was never going to let that happen. Pardon me, Your Honor, is that offered? Here's the statements are offered for State of Mind only. Yes, Your Honor. All right, the uh, statement attributed to Eric Men Menendez by Lyle Menendez is uh, received not for its truth but uh, just to reflect the state of mind of Lyle Menendez. 
And then, uh, that's basically what I remember he said. He said a few other things, and I don't remember exactly, but he was convinced they were going to kill us. He, he was then wanted to know what I had said to Dad. And, and basically was a, you know, very hysterical, accusing me of doing something that we hadn't talked about or something. And I told him that I had threatened him and that I felt, I told him what he had said and I felt that they could kill us. Was Eric mad at you for what you had done? He was, uh, he was mad and he was clearly still hysterical about whatever had happened with his dad not too long before and um, I was very shaken up by the fact that dad had done anything to him at all. I did not expect that. In fact that was the last thing I could imagine and uh, I immediately felt like we had to get out of the house. So did you leave the house then? No, um, we talked about it first. What and did you talk about? We, um, I tried, we tried to relax and um, went over to the couches like we had before <laughs> and talked. And uh, I said, you know, we need to get out of the house. Um, you know, he, he clearly felt they were going to kill us. I believed the same thing. And <laughs> We just had to get out of the house, and he, he immediately said that he couldn't, and that that would be the craziest thing to do, and that he wasn't going to just run out, run away, and let Dad find him and kill him. And what, why was it going to be the craziest thing to do to run away? Well, that's what he said, and uh, we talked about it, and we talked about a lot of different options, but. Uh, that was the one that I wanted to do, and uh, just the, you know, I asked him why he felt that, and he seemed looked at me like I was crazy, with the dad's power and who he was and who my mother was. That where were we going to go? And he kept asking me that in a in a very like, how could I think that way? Um, where are we going to go? Who? Where are we going to hide? And we started to talk about it, and um, I agreed pretty quickly that uh, well, there was no place that my parents could not find us, and that that would running away. Since we we decided that we couldn't be positive that they were going <laughs> to kill us, and we didn't certainly know know when or how, and that um, might be safer to stay in the house and not you know not bring it to a head by running away. How would it bring it to a head if you, if your parents found that you were gone the next morning? How would that bring it to a head? Well, obviously, I just felt that um, if I took off with my brother and we were gone past the evening, he would think I was, you know, that would be the, you know, he would immediately think I was telling people. and. Uh, you know, I mean, nothing could be more alarming to him. And I thought, you know, I didn't think that he could kill us immediately, uh, but I did think it was just a matter of time. My brother and I both felt that. Uh, so we talked about other things we could do briefly. Well, what options did you talk about in terms of running away? Did we, you talk about going to relatives? We talked about um, telling relatives and the situation. Well, actually, Eric mentioned relatives uh, on the other coast. And I told him the closest person I was to that I trusted was Aunt Terry. And <coughs> almost everything uh, that happened in my life over there, my mom found out and that I was sure it was Terry. And um, that that was a, that was a, a really bad option. Um, and we really didn't, you know, I wasn't going to go to any of my tennis coaches. And there was, no, there was nobody that we felt we could go to. Um, where we would be safe for any length of time. So we talked about the police, and that was pretty much dismissed right away. Why? Uh, we just 
felt, you know, we could go to the police and explain them the situation, but what, what could they do? I mean, they might press charges against my dad, and then we would be through for sure. And, uh, you know, then that would be, that would be trying to ruin him. And I didn't feel the police could protect us. Um, but it was certainly, you know, we talked about it very briefly, but seriously, and then just felt that, mostly we felt that if I went to the police, um, that they would kill us for sure, and that the police would not be able to protect us. And also, you know, there was, we're in Beverly Hills, my dad was a rich guy, and with a lot of power, and there was some concern that, uh, not that they wouldn't believe us, but that, that they wouldn't do anything. What about, the, why weren't your relatives, your other relatives? You talked about Aunt Terry, but you have other relatives. Why couldn't you go to... Well, I mean, my dad, my Aunt Terry is the only relative that I knew that stood up to my dad on anything. And, uh, again, she seemed to relay the information that I were, of what was happening with me to my mom, so that wasn't a possibility. And everybody else was just uh, completely intimidated by my father, looked up to him. Even the men in the family who were the strongest, people like Carlos Baralt and other, um, the male members, the uncles, uh, came to him for business advice to look over their dealings to get his two cents. And it, it just wasn't realistic to say, you know, here we are, we have this problem. This is what my dad's doing, you know, protect us. Um, what about just running away, going and living in a foreign country? Well, we, we just didn't feel that we could do that. Why? Because we didn't feel that it was safe. We felt that he could find us. My dad flies all over the world. And it was more than that. It was, it was more than just the money and the flying and stuff. It was that I felt my dad had the connections to find us and to, to get rid of us. And if we ran away, he could do that at his leisure. And, you know, he could just tell the story that we ran away for whatever reasons. People would believe that and we would disappear. And uh, that seemed like a horrible idea. Very, after we had talked about it, I agreed completely that it was the worst idea and we should stay in the house um, where it might be more difficult to just kill us without anyone knowing. And we would at least know where they are. And maybe they would never do it. That was another thing we talked about. And that I hoped. That maybe it wouldn't happen? Right. Did you talk about what to do in terms of staying in the house and, and making sure that you were safe? We talked about, I, I think it, I was the one that said that we weren't just going to stay around waiting to die. We were going to try and get some ways of defending ourselves and protection. And uh, Eric mentioned the guns that we knew were in the house, and I figured there were probably more in the house. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> dismissed that as a bad idea. They might notice they were missing and so on. So we just decided that we would buy our own the next day. The next day was Friday. Right. Is that correct? And did Eric spend the night in the guest house again, if you remember, or in the main house? On Thursday night? Yes. He stayed with me and he stayed on the couch. And Friday morning, uh, when you got up, was Eric doing something? Yeah, he was playing tennis. Well, he was practicing a serve or whatever. And did you go out and talk to him about what you had talked about the night before? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what was that conversation? Um, that was basically me explaining to Eric that he, you know, he had to realize how serious the situation was. And, uh, you know, I didn't know. He seemed to be trying to pretend it wasn't happening. And, uh, you know, I was feeling very un unsafe, sort of lost and, you know, distant from my dad, like, and uh, scared. And I was sort of relying on my little brother to some extent, and now he was pretending things were not happening, basically, and um, 
I told him, you know, what are you... We, we decided we were going to go and get some guns to protect ourselves, and, you know, this was serious. And that just because it was a new day and you wanted to go away, it didn't make it go away. And uh, I talked to him for quite a while about that and what, you know, what did he want to want to do and um, he agreed that uh, he, he mentioned something about that it would also be bad if you know that he didn't want dad to know he wasn't practicing and that could start a confrontation that could come to a head too and something about that but basically he was just pretending it wasn't happening and so after I talked to him you know he agreed we had to we had to go get some guns like we had planned and um, did you go to get guns? We did. And did you go somewhere in Los Angeles or somewhere else? We went to the Big Five. Where? Which city are we in? Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And what did you try to buy at the Big Five in Santa Monica? We went to buy handguns that we could carry around and uh, weren't able to do that. Why not? Well, we went there and we inquired about the handguns and um, I don't remember that big five as well but basically we um, were in the process of trying to pick a handgun and buy one and then we were told that we weren't going to be able to leave the store with them that it took two weeks a waiting period where they would have to check our credentials and they do this mandatory check and we'd have to wait two weeks and come back and so that was, um, we, didn't, we hadn't known that, and we just sort of, he told us the only thing you can buy over the counter is rifles, shotguns. So we just left pretty much confused. <coughs> Why wasn't it going to be good enough to get them in two weeks? Well, clearly we could not wait two weeks, and that uh, I really felt that my dad was going to act, um, that either he would act very quickly or my mom would make something happen fast. Um, we weren't going to have a lot of time because I, I did feel my dad thought I was going to tell people. Um, so, but in any case, we would never have waited. We, we wanted to get the protection right away. And they told you that you could buy shotguns or rifles at that store, is that uh, right? But you didn't buy them there? Well, we didn't want to buy shotguns and rifles. We wanted handguns and because uh, we wanted them to walk around the house with and so we didn't know what to do at that point and we just um, you know got back in Eric's car and started driving and thinking about what we could do at that point and where did you drive to we drove south down into like toward the La Jolla area where I had been a couple times for tennis and so on and one of my cousins used to go to school there. And as you were driving down there, did you and Eric talk? Yes. And what did you talk about? Uh, he started to tell me. Um, I just felt like I felt bad from Tuesday. What do you mean you felt bad for Tuesday? Well, I was very hard <coughs> with him Tuesday. He was clearly telling me something that was, you know, just killing him as far as telling me. And I was, um, you know, basically the statement, did you like it, was haunt, you know, was bothering me that I had said that. And so I wanted, I started asking him more about what had actually happened with my dad and say it was okay to talk about it. And we started to talk about that, um, although it was very hard for me to listen to. I talked to him about it. Why was it hard for you to listen to? Um... For lots of reasons, brought you know. I th obviously, I thought about my own situation, which seemed to be different than his, actually, but still brought back those memories and thinking about Dad and and just visualizing what Eric was telling me um, was making me ill, and I didn't want to didn't want to say let's not talk about it. I don't want to hear it. And for him, it was like. He wanted to get it out, and uh, it was a very uncomfortable 
uh, period of time, and we. And then I, you know, he started telling me. Then I realized realizing how sick it was. It was very different from what happened with me. It was very uh, much um, forceful. That that came later after the conversation, but. First, he was telling me just about some of the things that would happen, and they were very sick things. And um, I remember thinking, oh my God, I wonder what my mom is thinking, knowing that this information could be out there, and what my dad's thinking, assuming that they had discussed what we could say to people. <laughs> and that really made me very nervous, that I, I really didn't realize you just don't. I didn't realize till he started talking about it how you know the info, how bad it was that we you know how scared my dad might have been that this would get out and uh, it was more than just like he fondled his son or something like that. I mean this was very uh, sick and he started and it was forceful and he was telling me uh, he started telling me then about the threats that my father had made against him. That whole, all those years. <coughs> Truth of the matter asserted, or just a state of mind of the uh, witness? State of mind, Your Honor. All right, it'll be received for that limited purpose. Basically, he started telling me that my dad had one of the ways that one of the reasons he had never told me before was because my dad had always threatened his life. And uh, essentially used me against him, saying that if he ever told me, he would kill me, and that Eric would be responsible for my death, and uh, threatened him in other ways, physically. And my brother had just done th a lot of it in just fear, constantly. And so that disturbed me a great deal, and uh, actually made me angry with him again, because angry with whom? Eric. Because, Why? Well, he had. This was the first I was hearing of this, and uh, Tuesday he could have told me these things, and I felt like, you know, I told him, you know, if he told me these things on Tuesday, you know, would we would maybe we would have done something different? What I do wouldn't. You mean, would have done something different. Well, I, I, don't, I certainly would not have uh, just brought up. I would not have d had the conversation on Thursday that way, because my conversation with your father. Right, with with my father. Why? Well, I mean, the whole point of going Thursday was the idea that he was just going to let, we had all the cards, and obviously Eric knew that we didn't, that he, my dad was willing to kill over it, and uh, which is something that I probably should have figured out on my own, but I, I just didn't think about it. Eric had never said anything, and we just sort of went in in this fantasy state that it was going to be great. And I think if I had gone back, and you know, I told him Friday that, um, in an angry way that, you know, we could have just never said anything and tried to figure out another way to get you out of the house. Could have just said that you couldn't take it anymore for some other reason and you had to leave or just something like that. And If my dad didn't think you were going to, anybody knew about what was happening to him, maybe he would let Eric go for other reasons. So anyway, it was um, a bad conversation and he started crying that I was getting upset with him, and uh, I felt guilty again. Basically, we just, re you know, I told him, okay, now we know this, and that's good. And at that point, we thought we should definitely try to get some guns. Did this change the way you thought of your dad? After oh, Thursday, <laughs> Thursday changed the way I thought of my dad. You mean the talk? Uh, the talk and what happened to my brother afterwards, and then, and in fact, Tuesday changed the way I thought of him, but Thursday, him f basically threatening my life, um, going to that extent, really uh, confused me. I was just, I was sort of, my whole world was upside down for it. And uh, my dad was like a stranger, almost, in a sense, and I was struggling with that because he and I had had a very close connection and uh, I was not wanting to believe 
that he would kill me over my brother. And I, and I think he was probably wrestling with the same thing, like, well, why was I going to throw it all away just for Eric and ruin him? And so I, I was wrestling with these things in my mind, but mostly I felt like you know, this guy is more violent and dangerous than I knew. And that I, you know, if he could do this to my brother, he could do anything. Did you end up uh, in a gun store in San Diego? Yes, we decided we would go ahead and <coughs> buy shotguns, um, and that we felt that we felt that the if we were going to get <coughs> attacked, it would be at night, um, more likely, and so we felt we should buy them, and we went ahead and uh, tried to do that. And what happened? We, well, we went to a, like a smaller gun store. And there was an older man behind the counter, and they were asking lots of questions. And um, at some point, we had kind of decided on what we wanted to buy. And he was very much into the whole shotgun thing and telling us <coughs> that it was a great weapon for, for t house protection, and that's what we told him we wanted it for. And, and so at some point, we got ready to actually buy the guns. Um, he asked if we had California ID. Did you have a California driver's license? No, neither of us. No, I didn't have one. You're not. I have an exhibit that I have marked as 246. It's two pages. They, uh, it's a, a document from the Department of Motor Vehicle Order of Suspension of License. Yes. Showing you what we've marked is 246. Do you recognize what that is? Yes. And what is it? This is a. Uh, <coughs> I saw a similar form. I don't know if I saw this one, but at my Aunt Terry's house about my license being suspended in May. And, uh, having to turn my license in. May of what year? 89. And what state is that from? California. Did you lose your license because of too many tickets? Yes. And uh, you said you saw a letter like that at your Aunt Terry's? Yeah, my mom had mailed it to Aunt Terry and she had explained to me that I had to mail my license back, and she, you know, she gave me the form to read, and my mom was telling me that uh, they were going to charge me with the misdemeanor, or whatever it is, whatever it says here. I could read it, but um, if I didn't mail it back, so I mailed it back. Who did you mail it to? My mother, mm -hmm. and I had my New Jersey one. I had two licenses, and uh, so I used the New Jersey one. When you say you had two licenses, you mean when you, when you had the California license, you had both California and New Jersey? Right. So you mailed the California license back to your mom? Yes. So when the man at the gun store asked for <coughs> a California driver's license, did you have one? No. Did Eric have one? No. Did he have someone else's? Yes, he had Donovan's. And did you then... Uh, buy the guns at that store? No, we, uh, we were going to buy the guns at that store, but um, when he asked for ID, we kind of were taken back by that. So we didn't know that we had to show ID at all for these guns. And um, I, just <coughs> I just felt that it was, I talked to my brother a little bit out of this hearing, and I, we just felt that we should go outside and talk about the ID thing, obviously. And so we had that conversation first, and then uh, then we decided there that the whole thing was so awkward in the <coughs> store with the guy that uh, we had better not buy the, the guns at his store. Did you go to another store? Yes. In San Diego? Yes, I think so. Was it a big five? Yes. And did you buy two shotguns there? Yes. And what did you use for identification there? 
he used Donovan's license and uh, signed for it, and we bought him. And did anybody at the store show you how the guns worked or tell you about them? Or? Um, I don't. I don't think so. It, they might have. Um, and I think the lady uh, showed us just the very basics of it. You know, where the ammunition goes and um, just that whole thing. Uh, but she didn't have any like shells there or anything. I mean, we didn't. She didn't really. There was no way to demonstrate it, and there was no. Uh, you know, there was no way to show us. But I mean, she did some kind of explanation. But I was mostly wandering around the store, allowing Eric to complete the purchase. It was a long thing. She had a form with different stuff, and um, we had found out of a phone book. Uh, we felt that maybe you should have a local address since Donovan's address was San Francisco or something up north and we just we didn't know if there were going to be further restrictions like you had to be in that city we just didn't know the rules we kept finding out as we went along so he did the whole form and it didn't seem to be any problem and I I got a <coughs> box of ammunition and uh, where'd you get the box of ammunition they had a stack of boxes stacked up in the middle of the place and I took one or two boxes I don't remember and purchased them separately just went in the line myself and bought them then did you drive back that evening yes and what happened when you got home um, we got home and my mother came down right away and uh, told us about the fishing trip what do you mean told you about the fishing trip? She told us that uh, the time had been changed from uh, some point in the middle of the day to later in the afternoon. I remember the times and that we were expected to be go on the trip. And uh, my brother kind of said something and I said, well, we don't, you know, they had mentioned this trip to us before, and we had said we weren't going to go. And uh, did the time change have any significance for you? The time change had a significance. Um, I didn't really know what the original time was, but she was saying it was changed for some reason, and also the fact that it was in the middle of the day seemed strange to me as a time to go shark fishing. And I, I didn't believe the whole thing. I thought it the fishing trip was the way that my dad had designed to to take care of us kill us and because originally the idea was that he had lied to this executive guy that he was a deep sea fisherman and he had to do a quick practice session and that's how this whole thing arose and he had not expected us to necessarily go with him because I was going to practice tennis and we had a tournament coming up and he wouldn't have expected me to take five hours doing this but he had to and now he wanted us along with him and uh, so my, my, we gave my mom a hard time about it and she said well if you don't want to go you can go up and talk to your dad and she was very cold about it and we, we didn't want to do that so we just said oh, we'll go. Why, why didn't you want to go talk to your dad about not wanting to go? <sighs> Probably should have but I just uh, didn't want to have a conversation with my dad after Thursday unless he initiated. Okay. So she's told you about the time change. Was, was this a pleasant conversation with her? Or? No. She was, uh, seemed like she was reporting. It was like she was sent downstairs to tell us. It was like a message. Why did she come downstairs? Was, um, because we had come in the door. And you can, in our house, uh, the door was, you know, it was very noisy. You could hear it close very loud. And uh, so she came downstairs and gave us that message. And she usually, she, my mom always spoke as if it was my father speaking. Your father says do this, your father, 
wants this, your father thinks this. So that was the kind of conversation it was. But she was very, uh, she seemed very cold about it. Um, and I couldn't even believe that she would think that I would agree to go on the trip because it just seemed so completely out of, you know, we had just, we had this major crisis in the family and, and she was wanting me to go on a fishing trip. Um, had you talked to your dad at all on Friday? No. Did you see him at all on Friday? No. After you had the conversation with your mom about the fishing trip, what did you do? My brother and I talked about the f trip and uh, basically felt that we clearly could not bring shotguns aboard the boat. And uh, we basically didn't know what, what to do. What could we do? So we, we just decided that we would try and be away and sort of be late and miss it. How did you feel about the idea of going on the fishing trip? Was this just something that didn't sound like a good time, or did you view no, it? No, we time? thought that this was how they were going to kill us, and you know, we couldn't be positive, but we were pretty, sh pretty, feeling pretty sure, although it had been planned in advance, so we really couldn't be positive. And, um, we, I didn't, wasn't sure how I felt about it as far as whether I would, you know, say that we just weren't going and demand that we weren't, you know, say we weren't going if the time came or what. And you know, we, we didn't think that there was anything we really could do. Again, we didn't want to bring it to a head with my dad. I didn't want to let him know that uh, I wasn't you know, that I was going to cause problems. I was trying to be low-key and uh Were you wait. feeling low-key at that time? No, that was uh, one of a bad night. We were, uh, we wanted to stay in this, he wanted to stay with me in my guest house, and I was so, I told him, no, that's going to look bad. Um, just stay in your guest house, and let's try to make it seem like... You said stay in your guest house. I mean... You stay in your room, and I'll stay in the guest house, and uh, we'll try to make it seem like there's nothing, you know, we're not that concerned about the fishing trip, and maybe we can find a way to just miss it. Why did you want to look like you weren't concerned about it? What, what did you think was going to, how was that going to help? Uh, you know, my, at this point, my brother, it's easier to explain it, because in the morning the next day, my brother was just so afraid, thinking that they were going to kill us at any moment, that he was going to die, they're going to kill us. And um, I felt um, less and less in control of my own situation with regards to it, and feeling like Eric was going to do something, say something, and they were, and that was going to bring it to a confrontation or they were gonna just gonna get I just felt like if we brought it to a head my dad was gonna say if he hadn't made the decision he was gonna say we have to do it if he was wavering and I was hoping that he was wavering maybe wavering about what decision about whether he could allow us to uh, go on with this information go on living and and I felt like I didn't know how much time it would take my dad to arrange something if he had decided. I didn't know if he had decided. If he hadn't decided, I told my brother, I don't want to give them the indication that we're so out of control that we're likely to just not think and go tell the police or run off and do some of the things I had threatened. I was hoping to give my dad the idea that maybe I had changed my mind or something like that, although I wasn't going to go to him. And say that. Um, Why couldn't you go to him and say that? Um, just in, based on who he was and that uh, and that was just be play right into their hands I felt that I would go and I would say you know Dad, I changed my mind. I'm, you know, what I would have to do was say I'm going to abandon my brother. So I, that was I was never going to do that. But if I wanted to do it to buy time, my dad's likely answer is great. I'm glad you changed your mind and kill him anyway. 
And uh, so it just, unless my dad initiated the conversation, and then maybe I could think he was sincere, I wasn't just going to go to him and then have him lie to me. And uh, as he had said that, uh, that's what he would do uh, in that Chinese revolution thing. And uh, What do you mean? The Chinese uh, revolt, where the students were revolting. I remember my dad saying that, that the Chinese leaders were screwing up with the tanks and so on, and they should just acquiesce, give in to the demands, let it calm down, and assassinate all the student leaders, and the problem would go away. And instead, they were causing this big national scene on TV. And that's the way my dad thought. Um, didn't like messy problems, like things simple. And uh, so I, I, that's one of the reasons, basically the reason I didn't want to initiate a conversation myself, although I was, we were very much hoping that they would do something. All right, let's take a recess, ladies and gentlemen. We'll resume at 10 minutes after the hour. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 10 minutes after the hour. Sat in his room and I slept where I was, and we had just decided that more than likely, if something was going to happen, it was going to be at night. That's just what we felt. Um, and that was certainly uh, the only real purpose for having the shotguns uh, was for the night, and that's what we were most worried about. And so we just stayed up as long as we could um, while still getting some sleep. Um, and we figured after a certain time, then we were probably safe for the evening. So, so that's why I didn't sleep. Uh, <coughs> didn't get much sleep. Did you have the gun in your room that night? Yes. Was it loaded? Yes, I kept it in uh, my bed, loaded, every night. When you got up the next day, did you see your dad in the morning, on Saturday? Um, no. I didn't see him until uh, we came back. Did you and your brother go somewhere on Saturday morning? Yes, we left the house sometime in the morning um, and we drove Eric had we had <coughs> talked about the night before that being a little I had bought the shells separately from Eric and there was some conversation about it the concern for the whether those shells would actually work in the gun because I don't know anything about guns and so we just wanted it seemed like they fit um, but we wanted to make sure, so Eric found a place in a uh, phone book that I guess seemed like there was a lot of different kinds of ammunition and so on, and so we drove out there. Where was it, do you remember? In Van Nuys. And did you go to the gun store? Yes. And what did you do when you were there? We asked the guy, we, we told him the kind of gun that we had. And uh, yeah, I told him the kind of shells that I had bought and, and just asked him a bunch of questions about what he recommended and for protection and so on. And he was also an uh, extremely knowledgeable person and just going on and on about the, the different kinds of ammunition and eventually recommended a certain kind and we bought that. Did you uh, stay away from home most of the day, or did you...? We stayed away from home so that we could miss the trip, and uh, which was most of the day. In fact, it was pretty much all day, and um, we got back like around sometime around 4 o'clock, I think. Not exactly sure, but what, late. What time were you supposed to be back to go on the trip? At 3, I believe. So were you intentionally late? Yes, we were intentionally late. And um, you know, I didn't want to be too late, but I, didn't, I wanted to be late enough to miss the trip. And I knew <coughs> that my dad had arranged this trip and he had to do it, assuming he wanted to, uh, you know, something unusual wasn't planned. And so we showed up and they were still there. 
when you said you didn't want to be too late, why didn't you want to be too late? Again, we just, I didn't want to get my dad to think that we were purposely avoiding the trip and then uh, have him think something strange was going on with us. When you got back to the house, <coughs> had they left already? No, they were still there. How did you feel when you saw that? Uh, you know, I knew it when I pulled in because the cars were still there and I just kind of pulled in anyway. And uh, I believe my mom immediately came out of the house upset that we were late and let's go and, and uh, basically went right back in the house and they had had things arranged, whatever they were going to take. And it was just like a whirlwind of activity and uh, I never had a real chance to talk to my brother about maybe we shouldn't go or what. The next thing I knew we were heading for their car to go. Mom was putting everything in, uh, in Dad's car and we had some discussion about taking two cars. Who and wanted to take two cars? I wanted to take two cars. Why? Just thought it was safer to take two cars. And uh, Dad was insistent that we take the one car. And Did you sometimes take two cars when you were, the whole family was going to the same place? Sometimes we took two cars, sometimes we took one car. Um, well, it, neither would be real unusual. Um, but I, again, didn't want to have a problem with him, so I just said, fine, and we sat in the back. and. What did you think was going to happen on the fishing trip? We felt that the fishing trip was arranged to kill us in a way that nobody could know. Why did you go? We shouldn't have gone, but uh, I don't really know why we went. We just, we didn't know what else to do, and I, I was it was just a constant thing with me that I did not want to give my dad the impression that I was going to go tell people like I had given him the impression before, apparently. At least that's what he thought. And uh, so I basically just went along with the things he insisted on. And uh, so I went. We just <coughs> hoped nothing would happen. Hope we were wrong. When you got to the fishing boat, what happened then? We got to the marina, which I don't believe I'd ever been to before, at least not that area. And there was this sort of um, scruffy kind of, I guess it was a boat captain guy hanging out in the dock and my dad ran up to him and they started talking. And uh, then my mom got the stuff out of the back and we followed her toward the dock. And uh, then we got over to the boat, which was a very different than I expected. And uh, both my brother and I were, the whole thing was very uh, strange and we were, it made us even more nervous. What was very strange? Uh, just the, the boat was a, sl a very small wooden boat and we had expected, uh, we had been deep sea fishing before with, um, in Florida, and they were always, you know, big, I'm not sure what boats are made out of, but uh, like big white yacht type boats with, and this was a very small wooden boat with just one little section in the middle. It just didn't seem like the kind of thing that my father uh, would rent to do his deep sea fishing, so. Um, I could tell my brother was real nervous and I just didn't say anything about it commented on the size of the boat, something like that, and the captain said something. He seemed uh, all right, the guy, but I, I figured he was either working for my dad or he wasn't. And uh, so we got on and uh, we left. And where did you spend your time on that trip? We definitely stayed away from my parents in a, in a just felt, it sounds 
stupid, but we felt that at the very least we could jump off <coughs> if we th saw something unusual was going on. And we just tried to do it in a way that didn't look like it was obvious, but that it was difficult for them to get to us. And luckily the boat was des designed in a way that you really couldn't get around the side to the front um, easily. You almost fell off. You had to like swing yourself around almost. So we just stayed up there. Up there being? In the front of the boat. And uh, my dad stayed in the back with the uh, captain guy, and my mom was back there. Was your mom in the back with your dad the whole time, or was she? No, mom was mostly in the middle section, inside. And I wasn't sure what she was doing inside, but she was in there. Was the front of the boat a comfortable place to be? No, I, I felt, it seemed like you weren't supposed to be in the front of the boat, and uh, which is why we liked being up there, because it was very hard to get to, but it wasn't designed for people to hang out there. And it was a very cold, windy, like, choppy waters, and uh, the, the boat sort of bounced along, and water would come up, and, uh, you know, it was extremely uncomfortable and freezing, um, which was, you know, I was wondering if my dad was going to wonder why we were staying up there when it was clearly freezing and uh, uncomfortable, but we stayed anyway. Did you get wet? Yes. Did you stay up there through the whole trip? Basically the whole trip. We came back when uh, <coughs> my dad caught the sharks. Um, Why'd you go back when your dad caught the sharks? <coughs> he told us to come back and uh, I couldn't refuse. I just. And we, he had, they had caught a shark, so it seemed like uh, legitimate, so we, we went back. And there was a little shark, and uh, so we did whatever we did with that with Dad and the captain. And um, I think that's pretty much the only time we went back. My brother might have gone back f for something else, maybe to use the restroom or something, but I don't remember. When you went back when your dad caught the shark, was the boat captain there? Yes. Was your mom there? Yes. Were you afraid when you went back? I was afraid the whole trip, but I wasn't particularly afraid about it's. You know, we had caught a shark, and uh, so I wasn't necessarily thinking that that was something going on. Um, but we didn't want. We definitely didn't want to go back. But there was just nothing we could do. My dad said, "You know, come on." boys help with the shark, we were going to have to come. What time did you get back from the uh, fishing trip? We all got back around, uh, somewhere around midnight. And what did you do then? And my brother and my dad, I think, they went in the house upstairs somewhere and some, my brother and I managed to uh, leave and his car, and go over to UCLA. And what did you go over to UCLA for? We just wanted to talk, and we had not had a chance to talk really privately except on the boat, and we had no idea what was going to happen on the boat, so we just kind of um, really hadn't had a chance to talk at all, and mostly wanted to talk about the fact that nothing happened on the boat. and. Uh, did you think that meant maybe nothing was going to happen? We're, yes, I was relieved that nothing happened on the boat. I felt less <coughs> less sure that uh, they were going to do something. And uh, although the whole thing was very uh, strange, and so we went to UCLA in the stadium field, and we uh, hung out there and talked. We had a pretty long discussion. And did both of you, when you were talking, did both of you seem to have the, the same feeling that maybe things were going to be okay, or um, were you still no. concerned? Eric was still, uh, I don't think my brother was feeling better about the fishing trip too much. You know, I mean, it was obvious that nothing had happened on the fishing trip, but he didn't take that to mean anything. Maybe they had just felt 
we were too much in the front of the boat or something, you know, he wasn't sure. And uh, so we had a conversation about staying apart the next day and just sort of going one day at a time and uh, that I would stay home and maybe they would have a conversation with me or something or initiate something and I would give allow that opportunity and just hang out at home and he wanted to be out of the house he would be out and then he would check in occasionally and we uh, we talked about some other things also when you returned home did you see either of your parents yes who did you see well we came home and the door was locked and I tried to uh, I checked all the other doors and um, they were all locked. Um, so I figured uh, you know, they had been locked on purpose and we should ring the doorbell rather than just go over to my guest house and sleep there. What do you mean you thought they'd been locked on purpose? Well, the door had not been locked up to that point. So they had been locked and so I figured they were locked on purpose. So what, what time was this about, do you know? It was very late. I don't remember exactly what time. Did you wear a watch at that time? No. <coughs> so you rang the doorbell? Yes. And what happened? Uh, my, nothing happened, actually, for quite a while. And then uh, eventually my mother came down. And uh, she came storming down and opened the door and immediately started yelling. What was she yelling about? The fact that it was late and we were ringing the doorbell and waking her up and uh, just, just stuff like that that we just, didn't, you know, I made a comment that if, you know, she would give us a key instead of, uh, you know, we would be able to get in the house. And uh, she kept the keys. She liked all the keys and copies of the keys kept in this little drawer in the foyer. And, uh, you know, you could take a key and you could return it, but you couldn't just have your own key. And so I always was forgetting. And so whenever she did lock the door, since they were usually not locked, I was always, I was usually locked out. So I, we, I said that to her and uh, she just was furious and um, uh, she said a lot of, the things that she usually does when she's furious. What yeah. things did she say? Did she say? She, that she hated us, that, you know, we just were nothing but a problem in her life, and also that she wished that I was never born. And that's when my brother said something in my defense, and she turned on him. And that's when she made the statement. Um, that if he had kept his mouth shut, things might have worked out in this family. And she said it very, you know, in a fury. And as soon as she said that, she said some more stuff afterwards that I told her, okay, mom, sorry, and just basically let her win the argument and just, you know, burn out. And she ran upstairs. And uh, my brother and I stepped outside and had a talk by the cars about this statement. About which statement? The one my mom had made. As soon as she made it, my brother and I both felt that uh, she had basically given away what they were doing. Which statement in particular are you referring to? The fact that if he had kept his mess, she was referring to what he had told me and uh, that things would have worked out in the family. Um, and did you two talk it was similar about Similar to what she said Thursday, but it was kind of different. Did you two talk about what that meant? Yes. And what was that conversation between the two of you? Basically, um, just that she was, had given away, you know, something was going to happen. Something was planned. And, uh, you know, she hadn't given away how or when, but uh, that they had made the decision. We felt that they had made it. And that my mother, and I figured my mother, if someone was going to give it away, it was going to be my mother. And uh, we felt that she had. 
So the statement was to Eric, if you had kept your mouth shut, this family would have worked out? That if statement? you had kept your mouth shut, things would have worked out in this family. Okay. Did you, uh, after that conversation with your brother, did you go back and sleep in the guest house that night? Yes. And where did your brother sleep? He slept in his room. And did anything else happen that night? No. Next morning, did you see your brother when you got up? <coughs> um, I don't think so. I don't remember. What did you do all day Sunday? Well, I hadn't done anything. You know, I had stayed up late again, and uh, I did go to sleep, and I woke up some point in the morning. And I kind of just woke up and went outside to sort of see what was going on. Um, and then I decided not to go into the main house. I stayed in my house. And at some point, um, my brother showed up mid-afternoon, I believe. Did you... Uh, in the mid-afternoon, around then. Did you make a call to Perry Berman at some point that day? Yeah, I called. I had called him before my brother had arrived um, to see if he could go out that night, because that was part of my discussions with my brother, which was that we would try to have as many plans in the evening, especially with other people, as possible because um, it was just safer. And, and then during the days, try to be apart or not there. And so, um, yeah, I called Perry. And, uh, Did you get to talk to him? Or? No. I left a message. And during the rest of the... You said your brother checked back in with you at one point during the day? Yes, around the middle of the day. <coughs> what was the purpose of that, of having him? Well, we had arranged to for him to check in, so I knew he would be at some point, and uh, he didn't want to call in case Mom answered the phone um, at that point. So we, he just uh, arrived, and I, I don't remember exactly, but he might have come into my guest house. But we had a conversation at that point about what had happened to him the night before. And what had happened to him the night before? He had uh, had a um, confrontation with my dad. Had you heard about heard it the night before, or was this the first you heard? This is the first day? I had heard of it. Um, no, no, that's not the first I've heard of it. I'm confused. He told me in the morning before he left. We had this conversation. And then he came back in the mid midday to check on me again. That's the way it happened. Because uh, my dad had tried to get into his room the night before, he said, and had been pounding. Uh, this time there would be, uh, this here, so. state of mind again, Your Honor. All right, this is not being received for the truth of what was said, just to reflect the state of mind of uh, the witness here. Okay. So Eric and told you that his. That he your told dad me that, had tried to get into his room. Right. And he had had the door locked, and he told me the whole thing where he was sitting on the bed, and he had the gun there, and my dad was pounding on the door and, and demanding that he open it, and he wasn't going to open it. And, uh, you know, he was trembling, and he wasn't sure if he was going to shoot dad through the door or what was going to happen, and that they basically almost had this whole thing happen without me even knowing. And... He thought Dad was going to burst in, and he didn't, and um, he was pretty, uh, you know, really worked up telling me this whole thing that had happened, and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I mean, I believed it, but I just was, uh, I just amazed. And uh, How did it make you feel when you heard about this? I couldn't really have been more... Uh, nervous than I was already after what my mother had said it was just um, just added to it just the feeling that uh, 
Obviously that night was going to be a problem since I'm sure my dad was going to come back and uh, that my brother should stay away from the house. Did you uh, go into the house at all on Sunday? Yes. And did you see your parents at all on Sunday? Yes. During the day? They were um, watching tennis. And did you have any conversations with them? Um, just briefly. I went in and I said, I, I decided that I would go in and try to just sort of say hello and just see what the atmosphere was like. And I went in and I said hello and they didn't answer me. And I just kind of stood there and uh, they were watching TV. <coughs> and then I uh, went into the kitchen and um, was kind of shooken up by that. Was that unusual for you to speak to them and them to not answer? Not for my mom, but for my dad it would be unusual. <coughs> and uh, so I went back in again to try and get a conversation of just small talk going to say hello or whatever and I sat down to watch TV also in what the other they, chair. What were they watching on TV? U.S. Open or not the U.S. Open, the warm-up for the U.S. Open, whatever it is. They're watching the, the top pro tennis tour. I believe it was the tournament before and I think it was, oh I'd be guessing, but I think it was Brad Gilbert but I'm not sure. They were watching tennis? Yes. Okay. So you said you walked back in and sat down? I walked in and I sat down on the uh, on the little, like at the love seat thing, the other couch. And uh, at some point I tried to talk to my dad again and asked him about um, if he had the number to that unarmed armatrage camp in Marina Del Rey. Why did you ask him about that? Just to get a response, it was making me, it was just sort of unbearable not to have them say anything at all and I was feeling like a ghost, like we were already dead. And so I wanted, I just wanted to talk. And um, so he had in the past been kind of bugging me to try that camp and uh, I had not gone to that camp. And um, so I asked for the number this time, and he said, what does it matter anymore? And when he said that, and I just felt it was a problem. Why, when he said, what did you say, why it doesn't matter anymore? Is that what he said? No, he said, what does it matter anymore? What does it matter anymore? Why did that have any meaning to you? I mean, you're dead. You're not going to be around to be going to Arnon Armitage camps. And uh, that's the way I took it. You said your brother had checked in at one point in time right. during the day, is that correct? Right. Was that before or after the conversations you've just told us about with your Before. <coughs> when you uh, talked to Mr. Berman, did you call him or did he call you? He called me and uh, I might have called him. All right. So you had a phone conversation with him? Right. And was there anything unusual about that conversation? Um, no, except that, uh, yeah, there was something unusual, which was that my dad had lied. He had called at some point after I had left a message. Who had called? Perry had called, returning my message, and my dad had lied and said that I was out and that I couldn't do anything that night. Perry had been returning my message about doing something that night. And, uh, and your dad had told him that you were out? Right. Were you home all day? Yes. So did the fact that your dad had told him that you were out when you were home have any meaning for you? Oh, yes. It had a great meaning. What did it mean to you? I felt that um, something was going to happen that night, and he wanted me home. So when you talked to Perry, did you make any plans with him? Um, yes. I planned to, uh, he wanted to go, he was going out to dinner with a friend of his, 
and then he was going over to uh, something called a Taste of L.A. Um, and then uh, he wanted me to come with him. I wasn't going to leave without my brother. And I basically told him my brother wasn't home and I was waiting for Eric and I would meet him at the Taste of L.A. at least after dinner. And, and did you and your brother have plans for that evening? Had you talked about what you were going to do that evening? Yes. Well, we just did, we were going to go to the movies. So did you wait for your brother to arrive? Yes. And uh, when did he get back? <laughs> if you know. Do you know what time it was? It was late. And when Eric came back, did you talk to him about what had happened that day? Um, yes. We had a real quick conversation. What did you tell him? I told him uh, what I had happened earlier in the day, with, and I told him about Dad lying about me being home to Perry, and uh, that we had to get out of the house. How were you feeling at that time? I was... Uh, yeah, you know, the fear was growing, and it just sort of was getting out of control for me. And I was feeling very, uh, like, crumbling. And the night before, after my mom had said that, I felt like things were sort of... I was not in control. I was sort of slipping away, and I was trying to be, um, you know, not... I was trying to help my brother by being not as hysterical as he was and trying to say that things were going to be all right, and I was losing that. And especially since my dad lied about me being home, I felt that uh, something was going to happen Sunday, and I was scared, and I wanted to get out of the house. So did you tell your parents you were going to leave? Yes. I went in the house and uh, wanted to tell my mom that we were leaving. And uh, she told me that uh, we couldn't go and to stay there in the house and not go out. And I told her why, and I was supposed to meet someone at the movies, and that I was late, and that we had to leave, and she just had no answer. Um, she was just sort of confused, and um, I don't think she had expected that I was going out. Was it unusual that your parents would tell you you couldn't go out? on a Sunday evening like that? Yes, it would be unusual. Was and your brother there when you were having this conversation with your mother? My brother was um, there at some point. Where was this conversation? In the foyer, kind of in between the den and the foyer. Was your dad there? Uh, no, but my dad came in as soon as he heard the argument. and. Uh, he came in and sort of pushed my mom aside a little and... What was your mom acting like at this point in time? Uh, was this her usual rage or was she calm or...? No, she, my mom was uh, very uh, sort of real balled up and tense the whole weekend and, uh, you know, I really only had... Uh, those two conversations with her, but um, very cold, uh, seemed to be uh, v also really similar to the way I was, tense and uh, I think anticipating. That's, that's the way I read her. Okay, so she tells you you can't go to the movies, is that correct? Right. And what do you say to her? Well, I said to her that we had plans. I was supposed to meet a friend, and we were late, and you know that thing. And she had no answer for that, and was sort of stammering. And that's when my dad came in, and sort of pushed her aside. And that's when I noticed that my brother was next to me or behind me because he he didn't talk to me. Um, he spoke to my brother, and told told him to go upstairs to his room and wait for him while he finished his movie. And uh, and then my brother like didn't move, didn't know what to do, and I I said no, you're not going to touch my brother, and we had a big 
argument. It was actually was just a couple sentences. And what were those sentences? What was he saying? I don't really remember the sentences, but I was saying that he wasn't going to touch Eric, and he was just ignoring me and telling my brother to his face to get upstairs and wait for him. <coughs> and my brother left and went upstairs. And what happened? My mother came. Uh, my dad left, went in the den, and my mother was sort of still standing there and <coughs> said uh, something to me about that I had ruined the family. And I was just not saying anything. And then my dad came out and took her by the arm and said, come on, Kitty. And they walked into the den. And and then my dad closed the doors. And, what did you think was happening? Uh, I was sure that that was it. They were in the den, and my dad had closed the doors, and I didn't believe that the dad was going to finish any movie or talk to Eric. I thought he was just buying time. And I, I realized that uh, they had been waiting for Eric to get home, like I had been. And I just freaked out. What did? What did you think they were going, were doing in the den? What did you think was going to happen? I thought they were going ahead with their plan to kill us. Then? Yes. So what did you do? I ran upstairs to tell my brother that it was happening now and that they were going to, this was it, and they were going to kill us. and. I met him at the top of the stairs. He hadn't gone in his room. And I remember f sort of being surprised by the fact that he was at the top of the stairs. And I said something to him along those lines that it's happening and they're going to kill us. And he said something about that he wasn't going to wait for dad in his room and that he, they, we had to. You know, we had to do something. Some, I don't remember exactly who said what, but at some point I said, I'm going to get my gun. And he said he would get his gun. And How did you feel then? Just it's hard to describe how I felt, but I, like I had to run as fast as I could. And, uh, that my life was sort of slipping away and that we were going to die. Did you go get your gun? I did. And was it in the guest house? The gun? Um, it was in, yeah, it was in my guest house. And uh, I ran, I got it. Um, and where did I ran you go? Huh? Where did you go? I ran to where the, we had the ammunition. Which was where? <laughs> in my brother's car in the front. Did you see your brother there? Yes. Did you load your gun? We did. Did he load his? Um, or did you see? I just grabbed a bunch of ammunition out of the box and I was giving him ammunition and we were just loading as fast as possible. And. Uh, do you remember how many shells you loaded? Do you know? I don't remember. I remember pulling out of all kinds of shells and uh, just loading my gun and having shells on me. What did you do then? We went, I guess, my brother had, I guess, got outside through the study doors because he ran toward the um, the study window door, um, and you had to kind of go over this. I think you had to. We went over the little concrete thing. It was over to the side of the door, on the left, and we went through that door and we just sprinted to the uh, room, hoping to uh, get there when they were, were not expecting us. And what did you do? Um, my brother got there first, and just, we just burst through the doors, and uh, I started firing. Was the room 
lit? No. Could you see? No, it was anything? dark. The lights were out. And I just, I remember seeing, I don't remember too well, but I remember sh seeing a shadow right off to the right and my brother over to the left. He ran off into that direction and I started firing immediately in the direction of uh, whoever was standing right there. Was the TV on? Do you remember? Was there any light in the room? The TV, I remember, yeah, I found out later that, that the TV was on. I, I don't actually remember the TV being on, but there was probably light in the room from the TV. When you started firing, do you remember if your parents were standing or seated, or do you have a clear memory of that? I remember uh, who I realized was my dad at some point uh, sort of coming forward in my direction. So he was standing, and, uh, and I remember firing directly at him. <coughs> I believe he fell back. Was there a lot of firing going on? Yeah, my brother was, I guess, firing, and uh, there were there was things shattering, and the noise was phenomenal, and. Um, we fired lots of, you know, many, many times, and uh, there were just glass, and you could hear things breaking, and you could hear the ringing noises from the booms, and there was the smoke from the guns, and uh, it was basically just chaos, and I really didn't know who was firing at who and what was going on. I just was doing what, you know, firing my gun. and. Uh, that's really, that's what, I just was trying to think about that and not freezing. Do you remember firing a very close shot at your father? Um, I believe so. At what part of his body? <coughs> um, from the side, behind, kind of, I ended up there. Um, I don't remember the shot, really, but I remember the picture. The picture you saw here? Are you talking about your dad's head wound? Yes. And do you think you did that? Yes. At some point, was your gun empty? Yes. And did you, was there something about your mother that you learned then, either through Eric or you saw something or heard something? Um, could see sort of behind my dad, really barely, but could see somebody uh, moving, <laughs> seemed like moving in the direction of where my brother should be. And, uh, So I reloaded. You reloaded? Is that yes? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? <laughs> I ran around and shot my mom. Where did you shoot her? It switched over and I shot her close. Was that the last shot that was fired? Is that yes? Yes. Yes. What did you do after that? I dropped my gun and I went into the foyer and I sat against the wall. Where was your brother? 
Um, I don't really remember. I remember seeing him later <laughs> against the other wall. In the foyer? Yes. Did you stay there for a while? We stayed, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long, but I, I remember thinking that I had to talk to my brother and seeing him and sort of just being against the wall and just not being able to uh, talk to him. Didn't have the energy. And uh, so I don't know exactly how long we were there, but uh, several minutes, and maybe longer. And at some point, were you able to move? Yes, yes. At some point, uh, at some point we got up and... Uh, were you expecting something to happen? Yes. What were you expecting to happen? Well, at that point we weren't, we knew the police hadn't come. So we weren't expecting anything. We Earlier, had you expected something? When you well, were sitting there? Yeah, we ex I expected the police, that's what I wanted to talk to my brother about, was the fact that the police were coming. Why did you think the police were coming? <coughs> well, obviously the police were going to be there, you know, within a few s seconds or however long a time it takes them to get there. And uh, I was afraid to uh, talk to him. I wanted to know what my brother was going to say. Why did you think the police were going to come? Why did I think they were going to come? Because people would call the police or they would hear the noise themselves. <coughs> they, people roam in Beverly, in the flats, and the police station's only a couple of blocks away. But I really wasn't thinking all this. I was just thinking about what my brother was going to say to the police. Uh, Why were you worried about what your brother was going to say to the police? I, don't know, I, was, I just remember sitting against the wall worried that I didn't want him to say, I didn't want him to say everything that had happened. I was maybe say nothing, maybe, I just wasn't sure and I didn't want him to talk about everything that had happened. What do you mean everything that had happened? I didn't want him to talk about what happened, his relationship with his dad or my relationship with my dad. Um, so you remember thinking that, but you couldn't, did you Actually, he didn't know about my relationship with my dad, but uh, I just felt like I didn't, I didn't want that to come out. Were um, you able to tell him that at that time? No, not at that time. At that time I didn't say anything. I just sat against the wall and waited and figured, well, I just didn't, I, you know, I don't know. I was so exhausted. I just sort of, I couldn't talk to him. I was, I remember trying and him being against the wall and me just sort of sitting there stupid, like I couldn't move, paralyzed. And, uh, and then at some point we did get up and we, you know, somebody, we talked about the fact that there was, nobody had come. And uh, so then we started to talk about what we wanted to do. And uh, I really, I don't know exactly what we decided at that point. I know we decided that we should leave and uh, get out of the house right away in case the police were still coming or somebody would call late or something. I, I was just, just didn't want to be in the house at that point. And, that, and then we decided, um, to pick up the shells. Why were you going to pick up the shells? Because of fingerprints. Um, it's probably sounds like my idea, but uh, I don't really know. So we, and I don't really remember picking them up too well, but we did pick them up. Did you go back into the room where your parents were? Yes. And we turned on the lights. Did you look at your parents? No, I didn't. Do you have any memory of seeing what your parents looked like that night after you shot them? Just uh, from one or two of the photos.
But do you remember it from seeing them? No. Did you look at them? No. So you picked up the shells? We picked up the shells and uh, somehow we got, we ended up getting all of them apparently, but we really, I really wasn't too sure about the idea of whether it would matter to pick up the shells with fingerprints. So we did it pretty hurriedly. So I remember being surprised later that there were no shell casings at all. Um, but we did get them and we got, we went out, um, Did you take I guess we didn't put them in anything. I guess we just grabbed them and then we immediately uh, grabbed the guns and, and left the house out the front <laughs> and went to my brother's car. And, uh, Where did you go from there? From there, we, the first thing we did was leave and get out of the area. And um, he took, actually I was driving, I took a right and I believe I went to the next street. Where did you go after that? I, what was I'm not really sure, but I, I think we went to the movie theater. We had decided, I remember Eric saying, what are we going to say? And I really didn't know what we were going to say, but the only thing that we could say was that we were at the movies together, which was not a great thing to say, but that's all we could say. And so. Uh, we decided that we should go and get tickets because the police were going to ask us when likely for tickets and we would want to show them tickets. And then we also decided we obviously had to get rid of the guns. So at some point we did that. I don't know. I, don't know. I remember doing them, but I don't remember exactly which one first. I think we went to the movie theater first. What did you do at the movie theater? We went and parked on the side and ran in, and uh, there was a very short, few people in line, and we asked the person for tickets to the show that we knew was going to take place that night around 8 o'clock or 8.15, whatever was on the board. And uh, we asked for the movie License to Kill, because we, <clears throat> we had seen it. and. Uh, she said that that was, had been sold out for that show. And we asked for, uh, we said Batman, because that was the only other movie we had seen. And then she wouldn't sell us the tickets to the Batman show for that show, because it was almost over or was ending. She said that she could only sell the tickets like 20 minutes into the show, and I told her, we really need tickets for that show. And uh, she wouldn't sell us tickets to that show. So I just went ahead and asked for tickets to the next show, and uh, hoping that there was no time on them. And uh, there was a time on them. So I just, I think, I believe my brother had the tickets. So I think he just threw them away, and then we left. And where did you go after that? Again, I really don't remember if we went to do the guns at that point. We may have. I'm pretty sure we did, and we went... Um, Where, what area did you... Did you get rid of the guns? Yes. What area did you get rid we of We went the to the area um, that we, I normally took to get over the, into the valley, Coldwater Canyon, um, where we knew where there were mountains, some place where we could put the guns. So we drove up to Coldwater and I, onto Mulholland at some point and drove along there until I found a spot that seemed like I could pull over and we could you know, put the guns down into, down the mountainside. And who took the guns out? My brother. And what did you do while he was taking the guns out? I, uh, just circled the car around because we had to come back the other way because I was still going to try and make it to meet Perry if I could. And uh, so I circled around and he was finished by that point. And uh, he had run down and put the guns down and come back up. So he got in the car and we uh, continued 
driving to try and make it to the Taste of L.A. And did something happen on the way to the Taste of L.A.? We, my brother had some blood on his pants, and uh, I also realized we still had the shells. And um, so we stopped at a gas station along the way, and and the big dumpsters. We just pulled over and did the best we could. Uh, me searching the car for all the shells and any, anything else that might be in there. Um, and cha him changing his pants. And I may have changed something also. I don't remember exactly. How but did you happen to have clothes in the car? Well, he had a, his car was filled with uh, clothes, tennis clothes, shoes, you know, just sports stuff as well as other clothes. It was like a second room for Eric, the back of his hatchback. And so we just pulled things out of there, what we thought would look possible. And uh, so after we, we did that as fast as we could because we were trying to get to meet Perry. How were you feeling at that time? Um, numb. I was just feeling, I wasn't feeling I was just feeling numb, <laughs> exhausted, heavy, still in just shock that uh, really that the police hadn't come and that we were sort of, now this was going on and trying to think uh, clearly as to, you know, I mean, I really felt there was a small chance that uh, they weren't going to figure out what happened. And so. What did you think about what you had done? <sighs> I didn't really think about it at that point. I was sort of just lost and numb and thinking about what we were doing. Okay. After you changed your clothes, did you then go to the Taste of L.A.? After we changed our clothes, we went straight to the Taste of L.A. Um, we got a little bit lost, but we found it. Uh, who got out of the car when you got there? I got out of the car. How was Eric doing at that point? He was not doing well. He was, when we left the house, I could barely drive his stick shift and uh, was sort of trembling from, the, from just having been in the room, picking up the shells and leaving. And he was in worse shape, really, <coughs> mostly because he was crying and just saying, oh my God, oh my God, and shaking. And he was still in pretty bad shape even after we had kind of done the thing at the gas station. And now he was at the Taste of LA. And I was a little bit concerned of what was going to happen when I found Perry and Eric in the car in that shape. But still, I, I felt <coughs> like I wanted to get Perry for some reason. Why did you want to get to Perry? What was so important about that? Well, I... My brother was asking me the same question, and I felt uh, just like I wanted to go back with somebody else and not have to call the police myself. And uh, just... I just felt like the police weren't going to show up and I was going to have to eventually call. And maybe Perry coming with me would be easier. Easier in what way? Just comfort, just there. Just, I mean, I was going to have to talk to the police anyway myself and then Perry wasn't going to be able to help me through any of it. But just, just have my, you know, he was the only friend I had in the area. Um, and he wasn't the closest friend in the world, but he was somebody that was somewhat close. So I don't, there's no good reason, just um, basically some comfort to go with me just so we weren't alone. For some reason, my brother was no comfort for me. Um, I was starting to feel the loss. And uh, What do you mean, was, starting to feel the loss? I was, yeah. I was feeling a distance from Eric for some reason. I remember feeling like 
what we had done was really bad and feeling real dirty about it or just kind of bad and that my brother was bad also and just not wanting to be you know the blood on his pants and just not he was no comfort for me it was more like reminding me and I was trying to think about what was coming and uh, I felt like Perry would, I needed somebody there and other than my brother who was really just a mess and uh, so I went and tried to find him and he wasn't there did you call him? I called him. He wasn't there, and so I called him at his house. And uh, he was at his house. And he said that he had waited, and we hadn't shown up, so he left. <clears throat> and I told him I really got to talk to him. And uh, could he meet me somewhere, and we could talk. And he, I believe he suggested that this restaurant in Beverly Hills called the Cheesecake Factory. And, I said, okay, that was good, and we would meet him there, and however long it took us to get there. And then I, I believe I called him again a little bit later. Do you remember for short. sure whether you called him a second time? Not for sure, but I know that I did. How do you know that you did? Because I've seen the records. But you don't have a clear memory on your own? No. Did you then drive back and meet him at the Cheesecake Factory? No. Why and not? uh Well, we wanted to drive back and meet him at the Cheesecake Factory, but in driving there, we started to basically I started to lose control of myself um and which was I, I was afraid of that was going to happen and the whole thing was Perry was in the hopes that I could hold it together long enough to be able to meet with Perry and go back to the house, and that was clearly not going to happen. And uh, I was starting to shake, and I, I may have been crying, I don't remember, but I remember feeling, both with myself and with my brother, there was no way we could meet Perry and uh, him not know that something terrible had happened. So I drove, I didn't want to cancel the idea so I drove around I remember driving around for a little while first and then um, at some point was just started to fall apart more and uh, so we I said nothing I could do I just have to forget about Perry and go and call the police myself so did you go back to the house <coughs> Is that yes yes and did you go into the house yes did you go into the room where your parents were? My brother went in the room, and I went in the room and started screaming, and I went in the room to get him and pull him out. And uh, I did pull him out, and I believe I went upstairs to call. You uh, called the police? Called the police. Is that the 911 tape that's been played here right. in court? Right. And on that tape, you're crying? Yes. Was that real? Yes. Why were you crying? Well, I don't know. That's just, that's why I was calling. It was because I was crying and... What were you crying about? I don't know if I was crying before I went in the house or not. If I was just totally shaken. And, what but uh, after I went in the room and my brother's reactions, I don't know, I was crying. And why? Why? What, what was upsetting you? Just the shock. Just um, not believing that this was happening to me and that my parents were dead and that I was about to call the police. And uh, just, yeah, you know, it's really hard to describe the weekend and this, the stress and f the fear and nervousness and caving in feelings. I was really marginal throughout as it got closer to uh, what actually happened and uh, by then I was just really raw and 
just crying for crying sake, I don't know, crumbling. And I remember my brother apparently went back in the room, started screaming again. I was telling him to get out of the room. And you called the police and then what happened? I called the police and uh, the lady was I don't remember, it was a lady, I believe, that answered the phone. And, uh, Do you remember that from then or from hearing the tape? Really from the tape, yeah. Because I don't, I don't really remember um, <coughs> what I said other than telling my brother to get out of the room. I remember that. Um, Did the police come in at some point? No, they called again and told me to come out of the house. They wouldn't come in. And did you come out of the house? We came out of the house, and they just took over. And at some point, did they take you down to the police station? Yes. Were you interviewed by Sergeant Edmonds? Yes. And did you admit to him that you had killed your parents? No. No. Why not? We had decided before that we wouldn't. Who went in first? My brother. And you had talked about what you were going to tell the police? We had before I called the police when we were driving around and then when we were in the car, I believe it was when we were in the car, we, I, meant, I asked him what he was going to do because he was, he was really hysterical, crying on the ground, rolling around. He was really, I think it was from seeing my parents more than anything. But uh, I asked him what he wanted to do and uh, something like that. And he's, you know, whether he was going to go ahead with what we had said or whether he was going to tell him, because if he was going to tell him, I don't want to go in and give this stupid story that, you know, and just, if he was going to tell him, then I, I wanted to know so that I could tell him also. And he said that he would, no, it's okay. I don't want to tell, we'll, we'll just say what we said, we were going to say, something to that effect. And I said, okay, well, I wasn't too sure about whether he was really going to be able to hold it together. So I told him, you just let me know. You know, we're going to, you try and go in and talk first and you let me know um, if it's okay. Did you think he was him? going to be able to tell these lies? I did not think he was going to be able to. Why? Because uh, he was in very bad shape afterwards. And uh, I was trying to get him to relax and keep him together and not let him know how it was affecting me and just kind of keep him relaxed and I couldn't. He was really uh, all over the place and, and the police officer there was trying to help us also. And um, So I, I really had didn't have a lot of faith that he was going to be able to keep the story, but it was such a, you know, I was just hoping that uh, he would because I really didn't want to have to talk about it all. And after your brother talked to Sergeant Edmonds, did he say anything to you? My brother? Yes. My brother came out and said, it, it's okay, you can talk to him. And I believe he also came over and said something else. It's, you know, you can, I don't remember exactly, but he whispered something else about that I could <coughs> stay with what we had talked about. So I did that. And uh, I was nervous going in also, because I figured, you know, these are police officers and they're going to know I'm lying. and I. I just felt they were going to know, and uh, I had no idea how my brother got through it. So I went in and I talked to him, and uh, he asked me a bunch of questions, and I just tried to... I really wasn't sure what I was saying, but I was answering some of them and trying to keep with the story that we had made up, and also uh, 
just whatever I could do to make him th not think that it, it was us, basically. At some point you left the police station, is that correct? Yes. And did you realize later that you had left something <coughs> back at the house or near the house that could show that you were the ones who killed your parents? Yes. Did you return to the house? We returned to the house. The next one, you know, they kept our car and taped it in, um, which I had felt they were going to do. And just that night, I stayed at Mark Heffernan's. And what time did you go back? Uh, I'm not sure. Very early in the morning. And did you ask if you could get into your car? Or did you get into your car? No, I didn't ask if I could get into my car. Um, I don't think I got to ask anything. I think they sent us away, or sent me away. I had taken a cab over, I think. Yeah. And Did you go back again? Then I went away? back again, and somewhere around 8 o'clock or something, when it was a little bit more a reasonable time. And, and then I just sort of said I wanted to get in a few things. I believe I said I wanted to get a few things out of the house and was trying to find a way to get over to the car to search it myself before they did because <coughs> I knew that uh, as soon as they searched the car, I, had a, I just had a feeling that we were, that was going to be it because the car had, was going to have wrappings from when we bought it or extra shells or whatever. I mean, I just had not had time or the light even to search it real well at the gas station. It was kind of like a frenzied thing trying to get to Perry's. I hadn't really thought about it like I did. And then that night I said, oh, <coughs> we're, I thought we were uh, going to jail. And uh, so, so I did called Did you get back into the car? I did. And did you find any other <coughs> wrappings or shells or anything? Um, the guy let us search the car, let me search the car to just get a few things, and I was able to do a pretty good job. And I did find uh, quite a few things. And did you take them? Yes. And those things were all in the car at the point in time that you called the police the night before? Yes. Your Honor, could we break at this point? All right. 435 and we'll take our recess for the afternoon and for the week uh, we'll return on Monday at 9 o'clock don't discuss this case among yourselves